Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texags Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texags Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as pretty a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had <laughs> no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man. 50 50 ball, I gotta come down with it. You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. Look. If I were to ask you guys, who's like one coach in professional sports, college sports that I'm probably not a huge fan of, let me turn the camera to Olin Buchanan. If I were to say, who's a coach out there that like, I seem to complain about a lot on this show. You're going to have to be more specific. Come on, <laughs> bud. This guy, this guy we wish would have stayed. Bill O'Brien. Oh, you know me pretty well. Yeah. Bill O'Brien. Apparently going to be the OC at Ohio State. Loving it. Ross Bjork. Not necessarily his hire, obviously. It's Ryan Days. Yeah. Right. But it's just funny. It's just funny. A day after. I don't know if I was embattled coach, um, if Ryan Day, uh, I'm sorry, if, um, and Ryan Day is somewhat embattled because he's been losing to Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, if I would bring in Bill O'Brien to help build me out, bail me out. I will say this about. That OB. You're the real OB, but they call him OB. He is pretty good offensive coach. Like, I'll give him that. He, he's good with quarterbacks. He's a pretty good offensive coach. He is a horrendous general manager and a horrendous play caller. And most people in the building at the Texans, I can't speak for Alabama, thought it was a toxic work environment. So, I, look, it has nothing to do with A&M. It only has a little bit to do with A&M because... Ross Bjork just left, and under his watch, I guess, unless you want to call it Gene Smith, one of the first hires they've done is getting OB, not Olin Buchanan, Bill O'Brien as their offensive coordinator. I know if it was Olin Buchanan and I was the offensive coordinator at uh, Alabama and I was playing A&M in 2021, and uh, who's the guy that's the starting running back for the commanders from Alabama? Robinson? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, uh, the, the and, one who was shot. Yeah, and, and when he's – when he's running with you know, gaining big chunks of yardage and I get down inside the five, Olin Buchanan OB would run the would, ball. Would run the football. Bill O'Brien, thankfully, would throw the ball and thankfully Damani Richardson would, would get be the interceptions or they would end up having to settle for field goals. Yeah, I just just found it interesting. You know, O'Brien he he resurrects his career every couple of years. He was ne- mentioned a couple of different times for head coaching gigs. Uh, go do it. Uh, yeah, see, here's what I'm hoping, though. I'm hoping he's there for just days. So here, my scenario is Harbaugh goes to the NFL, you know, okay. pick a job. Michigan hires Brian Kelly. Okay, okay, tell me more, more, more. LSU's all of a sudden needing a coach. But Bill O'Brien. Bill O'Brien. Let's do it. That's just the way I. That's see the it. way you operate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, that is. Uh, this is Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. The Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations, and that was Coffee Talk presented by Texas Coffee. Beat the hell out of the morning by going to texaxcom slash coffee. How you doing this morning? I'm doing very well, thank you. Yeah. What's the What's the game plan for the weekend? Um, I've got a, I've got a difficult weekend because I've got to figure out how to cover the. A and M LSU basketball game from the television, and then figure out a way to, I guess, attend Ryan Broniger's weddings out. Right, the game starts at two. Broniger's wedding starts at four. You show up late, but can I show up in time for the reception, which is all anybody really wants to do anyway? I mean, I've seen enough of 
Ryan, you know, watching kiss somebody might be kind of uh, That'd be a little gross. Yeah, kind of yeah. gross. Yeah, um, probably grosser for Ashley than for me. But <laughs> it's going to be <laughs> a great joking, time. Joking, Ryan. We'll be there. It'll be a great time. I gave him a, a, a wedding gift yesterday, so I'm just joking. Uh, we all we all really like Ryan. Around Whatever here. you did, I'm doing a dollar higher. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But uh, I'm going to do that. We got Aggie basketball, which is very important this weekend. Uh, uh, win and women. Yeah. <laughs> Aggie men's and women's basketball. Yeah. The women with the number one team in the country, right? right? Coming in. Yeah. Um, I think they're number one in the country. They're if they're not, they're they're they, they, be, they're they, they're believed to be right. Uh, and you've got the the men on the road taking on LSU. I got I got some great UFC this weekend. Oh yeah, are you going to be fighting yourself? I, you know, I thought about it. I thought about uh, it. Sure. Uh, Sean Strickland, are you familiar with his no, act? No, I don't know much about. I think you and Sean Strickland would be friends. That's all I'm going to say. He's not the guy that. Don't go there. That yelled at the Canadian reporter. Yes, that's the guy. I like that guy. I knew you would like him. (laughs) I knew you would like him. I don't have to see him fight. Yeah, no, he's he's a baller. So he's fighting this weekend. What else do we have? Oh, we got a bunch of NFL playoff games to get into, too. Yeah, I probably won't watch them. Oh, no. Come over and watch the Texans. Oh, it's at the same time as the uh, the Bronny wedding. As the wedding. I hope the Texans win. I hope so, too. Yeah. I mean, Lamar Jackson's pretty darn good yeah in, i mean that they, they're underdogs but i really like uh cj, CJ Stroud. Stroud. i really like him so much thank goodness bill o'brien is there now and didn't ruin cj Stroud. No, i'm sure actually you, you know bryce young did pretty well with with ob so i mean yeah want well, a heisman with him yeah he did but i mean sometimes you you look at the talent you're given and you ask yourself did he do a great job maximizing that talent? And I would argue no. Couldn't win a championship. Did they make the playoffs in his time there? Yeah, they did. I think, the, the, yeah, probably, I think they did the first year. But, they did. But the fact is uh, they didn't win a championship. They did not win a championship. With all that talent. Hey, let's run our mouths. Three things we want to see brought to you by the Brazos Running Company, your local Aggie-owned specialty running store where you can find Brooks on Hoka Shoes located at Century Square, Below the Star Cinema Grill. Do you have three things you want to see this week? Well, weekend? I want to see uh, the Aggies uh, men's basketball team get off to a strong start. I like that. You know, um, where they don't have to uh, count on a big second half rally. Just go out and play well from start to finish. Yep. I, want, I want to see that. Uh, I want to see Henry Coleman back in the. Oh uh, yeah, that's a good one. I didn't have that on my list, but yes, he's absolutely there. I want to see. Uh, I want to see Ryan Broninger trying to dance at the uh, reception. I want to see him bust a freestyle. He might. Uh, he might be the uh, dancing bear. You know, he might, he might be light on his feet for a <laughs> the two, dancing bear, two hundred and eighty pound guy or whatever <laughs> he is. All right, three things I want to see. I want to see a wingman. All right. I always use superhero terms. I want to see a Robin. Right. I want to see. Somebody beyond Wade Taylor, and we saw it against Kentucky. It doesn't have to be both guys going for 30, right? But a, another capable yeah. scorer. I think Boots and Baton Rouge is going to be more of Boots, what we expect from That's him. what I need to see. And if it's not Boots, maybe it's Henry. Can somebody be a consistent, efficient scorer for this team um, where Wade doesn't have to you know, just be heroic in his efforts? So that's what I want to see. The second thing I want to see, OB, less threes. Okay. Look, they're not a good three-point shooting team. Wade, you do your thing. Everybody else, let's let's. I, I'm good with an open good shot, mm-hmm. but there are certain. But if they're not falling, we can bail. We don't have to keep shooting it. We don't have to keep doing something we're not good at. True. Yeah, um, you know, if you got an open three or you've got the the shot in rhythm and things like that, I understand you got to take them some of them, but. Man, sometimes they they put up some threes. Sometimes you got guys shooting threes that I don't know why they're shooting them. Yep. Um, but I think having Henry back uh, would be conducive to that because I mean, without can, him, you don't have much of an inside scoring threat unless it's uh, boots and Wade on the drive. How about you know a twenty-two point game from Wade, whatever, right? Uh, Eighteen from Boots, fourteen from Henry Coleman. You know, I'll take that. Henry could get you. More than that, but no, yeah, yeah. absolutely you can. But like, if we have three, yes, efficient guys scoring, I'm not saying they have to be the 30s. So right? what's the superhero? Uh, uh, the Justice League, the Avengers. I was gonna say uh, trio. 
Because you said Batman and Robin. Yeah. Well, Superman can join them. Wade can be Superman. Okay. Justice League. Yeah. Maybe they're the Avengers because they're trying to avenge that early loss to LSU. I like that. I, I can I'm appreciate sure that. I can appreciate that. Hey, let's, uh, if you want to be part of the conversation this morning, you can do it multiple ways. You can call us or you can text us. If you call us, we'll pick it up on the Brian Foley Law Hotline, 979-693-1150. You can also text that same number. We will talk to you. Let's go behind the glass and check in with Nick Savage. Nick, good morning, buddy. Howdy. Good morning, y'all. What's up? Well, uh, going into the playoffs for the NFL today. Playoffs? Or not today. Yeah, Saturday and Sunday. Playoffs. Uh, seven Aggies left in the playoffs Excellent. here in the second round. Include that's Name not them. including Dan Campbell. I don't have the list here with oh. me, Ob. But okay, we know BK. Josh Reynolds, Matt B K, Von Miller, Tyrell Dodson. Um, who am I forgetting? Uh, Mike Evans. No, Mike Evans. Thank you. Might be a few more in there, but uh, again, it's a lot already. Yeah, Dan. Oh, uh, well, he's not playing, but Kenyon Green on the Texans. Kenyon Green. Um, yeah. So. And then you mentioned the Lions, and that you're not counting them as players, but because they're AG not, but and Dan Campbell. Yep. Yeah, Aaron Glenn and Dan Campbell. Yeah, we'll be rooting for them. Also, just quick fun story. Did y'all see that Miami tight end Cam McCormick nine year was granted his ninth year of eligibility? He is Shouldn't older he be than Doctor McCormick. He's 25. He was a part of the same recruiting class as Jalen Hurts, and he is still playing college football. He gets a. Another year of college football and a break on his car insurance. Isn't that great? Yeah. What a year. How old was Chris Winkie? I know he didn't stay nine years. I he think was he older. was like 27. Yeah, he was yeah. old. Yeah. Like, like Brandon Whedon, too. But the difference was they came from late. Right. They came late. Because they played baseball. baseball. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else going on with you, Nick? You got a, uh, a game to cover tonight? I do. I'll be in uh, Brookshire covering the Navasota Rattlers boys and girls basketball team. And then I'll be with y'all Saturday at the Broninger wedding. Rumor has it Nick does not pay for a lunch in Navasota. When he walks in, just boom. I wish that were true, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Man, there's a Mexican food place down in Navasota. You've told me about this, Man, place. this place. Yeah, I need to go. Yeah, you do. Yeah, I need to go. Let's check in at the Angry Elephant News and Social Center making his debut. Jackson Moss. Jackson, what's up, buddy? Hey, how are we doing, David? We are doing... I'm yeah. going to speak for you, OB. We're yeah. doing well. Yeah, we're doing well. We're doing pretty good. Sweet. Yeah. So, uh, how, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm excited to be here, finally. So, um, I guess hey. I'll answer the question that a lot of uh, the audience has. Good voice, and, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it is. Like, yeah. Hey. Can, can you do Welcome to the Quiet D- D- Dave South would have said, man, that guy's got a good voice. <laughs> can you do That's a little bit of this? the best it's ever been. Try this. It'd be like... Welcome into the quiet storm here on Texags Radio. Try that. Welcome into the quiet storm here at Texags Radio. Not bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Outstanding. Hey, uh, tell us a little bit about you. I know you've done podcasts. You've done some broadcasting before. Tell us uh, how you ended up at Texags. Yeah, so um, I was going to answer the question that I'm sure a lot of, a lot of the audience members had, but uh, I'm actually not related to former first baseman Jack Moss. How about uh, Randy? <laughs> you guys look alike. How about yeah, Randy? No, he's got a couple, a couple inches on Santana? height on me. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Do you know who Santana Moss is? Yeah, oh yeah, of course. Okay. Of I'm course. Making sure. Okay. <laughs> I had to make sure. I know Santana though. Not yeah, not Freddie. Kevin but, Moss. Um, Are you familiar with Kevin Moss? No, I'm I'm I don't. I'm not related. I was I can't follow the Rip Torn show from yesterday. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I can't follow Very that. Very good. Very good. <laughs> nice Randy shot. Moss? <laughs> uh, I mentioned him. You know, that's yeah, that's usually people's first guess is Randy. But uh no, I'm just kidding. But, Moss and Cade. Uh, yeah. I know nobody. I, I just looked at you acting like I knew it. <laughs> He was a first-round draft choice cornerback out of Texas. Uh, yeah, I lost interest. Yeah, yeah but, Continue um, on, Mr. Moss. So uh, I'm from the North Dallas area. Uh, I'm currently a senior studying uh, communication at Texas A&M. I have done a podcast here at Texas A&M before uh, covering A&M football, and then I also had a radio show in high school. But uh, I actually heard about Tex uh first from my dad, and actually I gave Nick a, a picture to put up there, but – the picture is from the 2012 SEC Media Days, and um, look at that! I'm like 10 or 11 years old, but yeah, there's there's Billy right behind me. It's pretty cool that uh, I get the opportunity to come work for him now and work for everyone here. So it's kind of crazy at all. Came that full is an circle. awesome picture. I'm glad you brought that. When Billy is here, we got to. I'm sure. I think he's probably watching the show, but we got to show him that. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, it is awesome. Hey, you got some news for us this morning? Yeah, just a couple things. Uh, women's tennis was picked to win the 2024 SEC Women's Tennis title in a preseason coaches poll for the second straight year. Um, men's tennis pen- or was picked to fi- finish f- uh, fifth in preseason SEC coaches poll. 
And then uh, also a quick reminder that the Aggie softball team is scheduled to host a fan meet and greet next Saturday, January 27th at Davis Diamond. And then they're going to start the meet and greet at 1230 with player introductions, followed by Q&A with uh, head coach Trisha Ford. And then uh, last thing, quick shout out to one of my favorite a and players of all time, Devon A. Chain, for being nominated for NFL Rookie of the Year. But it's looking like C.J. Stroud is going to be obvious, the obvious favorite. Uh, the betting odds are like minus 3,000 or something like that for C.J. Stroud. It's, it's hard for me because I'm more Aggie than I am Texan, mm-hmm. right? Right? Like I... I think CJ has been because of the success story, but if Devon won it, I, I, I couldn't argue. I think he missed a little bit too much yes, time. Yes, I, I think that's... He missed six games, I think? I, Five games? I, I don't know exactly. I know a, a significant amount of time. Is spent, and, it, and he first got hurt when he just had a huge two weeks or something. So uh, had he been able to play the full year, uh, this might be a really interesting vote. But it's... First of all, it's hard to ignore a quarterback, and especially when you're a quarterback that was taken as early as he was, and that means the team he's quarterbacking was terrible. Right. And then to get that team not you know into the playoff playoffs that that that's pretty amazing. As much as I like Devon, I, I mean, he's one of my all-time favorite players too. I think he's the best running back ever at Texas A&M. It's a shame that they weren't able to maximize his ability here. Uh, but that said, yeah, CJ's the CJ's the pick. And CJ's the pick, yeah. No doubt about that. All right, let's do this. Let's hit a break. We're going to come back. I'm going to ask you how patient we're going to be with Mike Elko in success next year. And then I'm going to also ask you one, how patient will Bama be with you, you mean the, Kalen the, DeBoer? Uh, Bama, the uh, farm system of the University of Texas. <laughs> right? Oh, my gosh. I know. We'll talk about that. i got some other things to get into as well. Right now, though, look, nothing witty. You know, sometimes I say that too and we get witty. Yeah. But look, I'm in the mood for barbecue. That's the bottom line. I want to eat barbecue. And if I'm going to eat barbecue on a Friday, I have an option. I yeah. can get barbecue or I can get... Or, or you can get the four C's, which are catfish, coleslaw, corn, and crunchy hush puppies. Because a lot of people don't want to eat uh, meat on a, uh, on a Friday. And that's okay because of a religious fries. But if you want a religious experience... Mm. Wait till tomorrow and go get you some of those rib tips. The rib tips is, but it, some, but you know what? There's nothing stopping you from going today and tomorrow. To be honest with you, you can go every day but Monday. That's right. Are they open on Sunday? Sorry, you can't go on Sunday either. Yeah, day, closed on Sunday. So Tuesday through Saturday, you can go. You can go. But but you you know what you can do? You can double up, take home, eat on yeah. Sunday. Well, and Monday. Yeah, you know because. What I would do, uh, what I would be inclined to do would be call early on, because you know how much I love the rib tips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd call early and order two pints of rib tips. Can we change your, your name to rib, to rib tips? Rib tips. Yeah. No, I've been called worse. Yeah. Often. RT. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, all week, you know, again, you can get the rib tips on Tuesday. You can get the that great chopped beef on a baked potato on Wednesday. You can get the the uh, the, the the pork chops and uh, macaroni and cheese Thursday, and today, back to today, the four C's. 1701 South Texas Avenue in Bryan, without a doubt, the what? The best barbecue in Texas, which equates to being the best barbecue in the entire world. Trivia, did you know that's their trademark? That's because it's true. Oh, it is. It's Fargo. Facts!
You were saying? No, Kane Agley just came in and told me that the game's actually at three. Now, Richard Zane was telling me yesterday it was at two. Let's play and, Richard. I, and I didn't – well, I'm just saying, I, I didn't look at the schedule yet to see what time the game actually started. So, I don't know how much of Broninger's – I won't I will see obviously any of Broninger's wedding. I don't know how much of the reception I'm going to be at. You know, I mean, you want me to Facetime you? You can pretend like you're there. Well, no, I mean it's not. I, I, how much I see is going to be dependent on how much guys like you and Kay and Lucci are partying. I mean, how long is it? Go, how long is it going to be going? I don't party, and I will definitely not party with any of our staff there. If I were at another party. Our staff, that they Snapchat each other and they text message each other about us. No chance I'm dancing in front of those freaks. Hmm. Well, like, no. legit. They'll be like, look at Nuno. He's dancing to Bad Bunny. And they'll take little videos and they'll share and they'll laugh. No. No, not yeah, going to do that. Yeah. You dance to Bad Bunny, do you? I don't dance, dude. Oh. Like, I can't dance. I don't want to dance. I bob my head. I'm like 50 cent at the club. Yeah, bobbing your head. Okay. Bob my head. Yeah, like that. That's how I roll. Right. Anyway, let's uh, <laughs> let's get to the topic. What is the topic? Patience. Really, my question is more about Alabama than it is about A and M. But I want to start off with A and M because I be- I believe, except on the game day thread, this university, this 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 fan base is going to give a little grace to Mike Elko. Yeah, they always do. the 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 first year coach almost always gets grace, you know, because. Any failure is going to be is typically blamed on the predecessor. But I still think we have pretty high expectations. Well, we have higher than seven win expectations next year, regardless with the schedule. We should. Uh, I, and it's going to feel like a repeat of a show I did last year. I, Nine wins to me is the bare minimum this university should be expected. Here's what I think. I think, um, I think Mike Elko will be fine in everybody's minds, as long as they win, the games are supposed to win and are competitive. Maybe pull off a win, but you need to be competitive in that game against Notre Dame and Missouri and LSU and Texas. At at least, I'm saying at least competitive. I mean, you can't be embarrassed. Go out and and win the other eight because, quite frankly, you should. If you win the other eight – and you, because A and M's lost games they shouldn't the last three years. Yeah, and you split the games that you're not expected to win. Oh, now be, we're talking about ten or two, and then, uh, th- 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 well, I would say if he went ten or two, they'd probably give him a big raise in contract extension. But that guy's in Ohio. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I'm joking, Ross. If you're listening, I I know you're not, but I'm joking. Um, <laughs> because one year means everything is going to be okay, you know, so you got to go all in. After. Well, I, I do believe that there's going to be patience, but not too much patience, right? Like, there, there, expectations are going to be, are we advancing the program? Are we stuck in neutral, to borrow a term? And I don't think we are going to be stuck in neutral. I think everything Mike Elko has done so far, I know you wrote a, a recent column about uh, his, his start here, everything has been in the right direction, right? The relationships with the high school coaches, the transfer portal, a night and day from what we saw before. And some of it by need, by necessity, right? You, good, what we think are good hires. Yep. Great hires uh, so far, yeah. His decision to get, bring in a special teams coach to clean up that that mess, uh, you know, and a, a strength and conditioning coach that has a heck of a background. You know, I think he's done Every step piece. I think the next thing is if he can close out on Terry Bussey, you know, yeah. then, then then you have safeties to say, coach Terry Bussey, top of mind, right? Right, and he had a safeties coach that was kind of beyond his, uh, you know, his. Re- I mean, he he made a good hire, but when a guy decides to go back, you know, you can't put that on Elko. And then I flipped the question: How much? Actually, I'm going to two part it, Ob. How much patience is Alabama going to have for Kalen DeBoer in year one? And also, I know he's been pretty successful, but how much patience is LSU going to have for Brian Kelly, if he's still there, by the way? Um, Because if you look at that roster, they really haven't hit the portal hard. They've got questions at quarterback. I think their defense might be better, but how much better will they be? Well, first of all, LSU, just in the last 15 years, 16 years, have fired two 
national championship winning coaches. So how much basis do you think they're going to have? Right. <laughs> and Alabama, there are people in Alabama who have shot their in-laws because they weren't upset enough about a loss. Not upset enough. So if Kalen DeBoer thinks he's going to get some grace, uh, you would think that there are some reasonable people in that po- Alabama populace that will say, look, it's his first year, and look at how many people are, are, have left. And he's, had to, he's having to rebuild because of all the guys that are leaving because they only wanted to play for Saban. And, you know, like Caleb Downs looks like he's going to Georgia and right. you know, so on. And the rational – mind would look at that and say, oh, man, this guy, man, he's in a tough spot. We're going to have to give this guy some, you know, some, some, some time, some grace, as you say. Yeah. I don't know how many rational people live in Alabama Yeah, that are Alabama fans, I should say. Hey, I'm going to – actually, I'm going to read a couple of text messages. Let's go back to Jackson Moss there at the uh, Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Jackson, read to me the Rob from Dudley's Draw question, if you don't mind. I'll read it for you. What kind of dessert does Fargo's have, OB? I'm not in the dessert community. I don't go to the meetings. I haven't been in, in, in years. To- I have to admit, I have every time I've eaten there, I've been too full. To get the dessert. To get dessert. Because you got meat dessert. So, yeah. <laughs> but I know they have stuff, right? I, I don't know because I've, ne- I, I, cause I've never partaken. I, I wonder, you know, it seems like everybody, and I don't know this, so my answer is I don't know. But it seems like everybody has like peach cobbler. I don't know if they have it or not. That's right. But you uh, know what? That means we need to make a trek over to the Fargo's here in the next couple yeah. of days. Uh, Jarrett on the angry elephant uh, to the news. So it's, I don't know. I messed that up. Says uh, Bill O'Brien's initials are B O, not O B, because he stinks. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, J W says, "How do they not promote Heartline to O C? Makes zero sense." Um, yeah, I think uh, A&M should, if they ever have an opening again. I like our guy. If I'm saying if they ever if, do, yeah. I like our guy too. And I think he might. I wouldn't be surprised if he pulls off some magic between now and February. But um, but if they ever had an opening in that position, I, I might use that as a reason to go try to lure a, a Heartline, who's a great recruiter down here. All right, let's hit a break. We're going to come back. i got a couple things I want to get into uh, with the OB. Uh, Connor O'Gara, a friend from Saturday Down South, says the SEC's most important players who turn down the NFL draft. Nobody's from A&M hmm, on there, okay. but I'm going to give you that list and get your thoughts on, on Connor's five. Right now we're talking Heritage Films. That is a company that makes documentary films about families, right? You know, you, you're not promised tomorrow. You are not. Your, your family isn't promised tomorrow. And uh, you want to make sure that you can cherish those memories and have them recorded and, and kept for a long, long time, for generation after generation. That's what Chance does. He brings families together and he tells their story in a documentary form, two-hour style documentary. We've done it with my father. It's fantastic. And I highly recommend it. And it's not just about the, the family experience. It can be. It can be your family ranch. It can be your family business. It can be a neighbor, somebody who's important to you. It could be some rituals that you, you and your buddies do. If you go play golf every weekend and you want to capture that, you go hunting, you do whatever your group of friends does, you can have Chance be an eye in the sky at a party or an event, and he can tell that story in a documentary form. He also does the ear flicks. These are 20-minute videos, benchmark videos, that tell people stories in a Q&A form, right? That's the difference. Like it's One is a very long thought out story and the other one is more benchmark find out about your kid freshman year to sophomore year to your junior year to senior year make it a four chapter story right there it is called the year flicks the phone number for heritage films 713-893-8341 713-893-8341 the website yourheritagefilm.com again that website yourheritagefilm.com
See, this is how I dance. If you're watching on the CW, is it's kind of Bob Bunny. No, it's not Bad Bunny. Wow. Bob Bunny. Bob Bunny talk like this. Oh, okay. That's uh, 50 Cent. Oh, okay. Curtis Jackson was shot in the face. Ouch. Yeah. He looked at that bullet in the face and said, it doesn't matter, bro. I'm here for you. I probably actually. Probably Get Richard die trying, OB. Hey, by the way, uh, Rob at Dudley's Draw. His uh, nephew, the great Justin Escobar, MMA enthusiast and coach and fighter. Who, Rob? Rob's nephew, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, they have cake and peach cobbler. Yeah. You can buy cake by the slice or the entire cake. You can buy a peach cobbler by the bowl or an entire pan of it. Remember when we learned what cake by the ocean really meant? I still don't know. <laughs> I didn't know. I was singing that song one day and we learned. Hmm. Good Jared Schultz taught us what it meant. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It is Texas Ags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We are here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. It is the Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. We'll get to your text messages here in a moment. All right, OB. Yeah. Connor O'Garris, the five most important players who turned down the NFL draft. Okay. I'm going to go backwards up, all, all right? right? Number five. Number five. Brew McCoy. Well, I'll say this. Um, he's a good receiver. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess they still have Squirrel, but – you know, it's it's important for Tennessee, I would think, with the the way they play to have good receivers. And, um, yeah, I can see that being important for Tennessee. Number four, Jackson Dart. Um, I don't yeah. know what his NFL potential Look, was. Look, they're talking about playoff, or playoff already. Um, and As they should. they got a loaded roster. Yeah, and, and one of the big pieces of that is – Jackson Dart. I know they got Sanders from Oklahoma State, but um, Jackson Dart is clearly the better quarterback. And so, yeah, that's when you got huge uh, aspirations, a big part of that is that you have an experienced quarterback coming back. Yep. Number three, Quinn Ewers. They don't even know if he's going to be the starting quarterback over there. I think they know. You hear people talk over there. They're like, yeah, you know, it's uh, Arch Manning. Uh, and that. Who who says that? Fans or like analysts are saying this? Uh, both. Really? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm reading stuff from over there. And, see, I mute a lot of Texas stuff, so I don't see it. Um, well, you know, I have friends over there. Yeah, you, yeah, you, um, you lived there a long time. I would assume. I mean, there were some that actually wanted, and I'm saying fans, that wanted uh, viewers to actually go. They don't want. They're afraid they're going to get into that that Apple White Sims deal again. Oh yeah. Um, but um, he's good. He's a good quarterback, and he he quarterbacked that team into the uh, playoff playoffs. So That's the third time today. I you've can't done do. It. I can't. It, it's impossible for me to to say <laughs> playoffs without saying playoffs. I think it every time you say playoffs. <laughs> Any, anyway, four times. Okay, I'll, I'll try to. Can, can we? Get I'll try not to use the word. So he got them into the post-season. to that postseason tournament. And uh, season. Sorry. turn right. And uh, so, so yeah, okay. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. I just realized your playoff sounds like a parrot. Yeah, it does. So did Jim Moore. Have you seen Jim Moore's commercial? Now? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love that that he's making fun of himself. Yeah, good. He doesn't look like he's aged very much. He looked no, good. No. They probably put a ton of makeup on well, him. That, that happens. Out. Um, Number right. two. Number two. Are you familiar with a guy who may not even be the starting quarterback, Jalen Milrow? My voice cracked. Yeah, I think he's gonna be. But yeah, I think he will too. Uh, I mean, who do they have? Nobody yet. It seems like everybody's leaving now. He may, we may see the uh, Rogers show up there. Yeah. In fact, it makes sense to see Will Rogers show up there. He went all the way from Starkville to Seattle to play for Kalen DeBoer. Why wouldn't he? Why would he not? Uh, so, but does Jalen Jalen Milrow's a good quarterback? If you, he really got better as the year went well, on. Well, because they tailored the offense to what he does well. Is Kalen DeBoer going to change his offense to fit uh, Jalen Milrow? Right. How how is Jalen Milrow going to fit in Kalen DeBoer's offense? I think it's a it's a legitimate question. But yeah, he's a he's a good. Qu- I, I guarantee Alabama would rather have him than be in a position where they say, okay, what are we going to do? Right. Okay. Again, so far, uh, I have no issue at all with anything uh, Conor O'Gara has written here. 
And let's do the last one. Number one is OB Carson Beck. Okay, now maybe I'm starting to have some issue. I, was anybody really thinking Carson Beck was going into the draft? I didn't. I didn't think it at all. He hasn't done enough. He hasn't done and And I still have – He's good. He's a good college quarterback right now. I still have certain misgivings about him. I'm not saying that he's not good and doesn't have a uh, not going to have maybe some, some some NFL potential. But um, I don't know their depth chart, so maybe it's huge that that Cars back. I I'm not sure. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't rather have Jalen Milrow as my quarterback than Carson Beck. And Quinn Ewers, and who else was on that list? Uh, uh, and and Jackson, Jackson Dart. If you would put Carson now, now they're going to come back and say again. I don't I don't know their uh, depth chart, so maybe he's all they got. So it's important. And you know, now they're to that point where you have to win the national championship. You're Georgia. You get you. Oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're talking about Georgia. Georgia. Right? Yeah, you're Georgia. You should have a second quarterback ready to roll. And, and, and maybe they don't have a lot of confidence in him. So, so from that standpoint, I guess I'd put it this way. I'm not sure that I wouldn't want the other three quarterbacks mentioned before Carson Beck. How different would we look at Carson Beck had they gotten into the playoffs, though? Had he won a national championship? Like, he didn't. So, but... I don't know because of all the teams that didn't get in, they're the team that I I understood why they didn't get in. I disagreed with it. Look, I looked at all the talent around him, and I'm saying uh, the guy before him, Stetson Bennett, really good college quarterback, right? He leaves, and they just plug in Carson Beck, and they almost win a championship. Yep. And they probably would have if uh, McConkey and uh, Bowers had not been hurt. They were, I mean, they played, but they weren't clearly weren't 100. percent and those were, you know, their two biggest offensive weapons. So this uh, this will only derail the show for about a minute. On the YouTube page, Sam Man's asking which UFC fighter is my favorite, and I said I don't know. Like I, I'm I'm a Conor um, McGregor fan. As I am a fighter. now. <laughs> Why now? Oh, he's mad at the uh, Irish government. Oh yeah, and yeah. He's threatening him. Uh, and I, like I like Adesanya a lot. I like Sean Strickland a lot. But like, what some people are saying is that they don't like Conor's. Um, and what, what was the word they said here? A couple different guys said, um, piece of trash as a human being. There's a lot of stuff I don't like about Conor McGregor. Uh, my brother can't watch him I at don't all. know enough about him to know if he's but a piece of trash. The brand, the marketing, the, you know, up until his, his beat down um, against Khabib, up until that point, like, that was a marketing machine, and it still is. He's coming back. So I don't want to de- derail the show too much, but uh, answering that question out loud. Let's get to some text messages. We go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Jackson Moss, what do you got for us? All right, I got uh, Chris in Nashville, and he asks, if Bork moves on, does A&M go after an established AD or someone younger and up and coming? Have have we seen, or I'm sorry, he's seen the Washington AD's name mentioned. I haven't seen the Washington's AD mentioned because I haven't been really looking for that. And I think we... I think we might have um, addressed this earlier in the year. I mean, earlier in the week. I like Oliver Luck. Somebody suggests that. I think that's awesome. I haven't seen him as a legit. I haven't seen actually a real. I, I but saw I'd the, make the call. Uh, the Florida AD. I saw that name out there. Um, I forget his name. He, he's a name. And I saw people on, on Twitter that were Florida fans were like, take him. Yeah. That's usually a sign that, you know, like that. Yeah, except Florida fans are always pissed off. Yeah, that's off. true. Um, <laughs> but that's the name I've seen Maybe out there. Maybe they're mad at him for hiring. Uh, uh, Billy Napier. So, well, look, regardless, do I want to – I don't know if young and up-and-coming is what I want. I don't want an old – I'm not against an old dude. I want somebody who's – I don't think you're old, Obi. <laughs> well, you're, you're just wrong, age though. challenged. <laughs> age challenged. Uh, I, again, I just want somebody who embraces the new world of college sports. I want somebody who's just competent and wants to be here for more reason than the paycheck. I want somebody who's going to be innovative, set a tone, and where people follow the A&M model, not because we set a a market with bad contracts, but the way we go into things, the way NIL evolves, the way the entire athletic department gets on board with that vision. That's what I want. I mentioned uh, 
a guy that a lot of people know, and then a lot of people probably don't know because he's not in the, he's not an athletic director right now. But I've mentioned John Heidke before. I think he'd be great. I think Hunter Goodwin would be great. You know, I don't think Hunter he's a little busy. It. He's got a lot on his well, plate. But I think he'd be great. How because, about Billy Lucci? Um, no, because uh, <laughs> you know what? At some point, you got to be financially responsible, and just the the lunches would uh, <laughs> they would they would add up. <laughs> yeah, it, it would cut too much into the NIL fund. Um, yeah, look, <laughs> the lunches that I never go to, by the way. You've gone on two. I'm, I'm in the two years, the three years I've been here. I've been, been one. Uh, I'm joking. Anyway, I don't. But I don't know. I don't. I have to admit, and, and maybe maybe this is a uh, uh, something to call me out on. I'm not up on all the athletic directors. I'm not either. I know Burns at Alabama. I know Bjork's at Ohio State. I know DeConte's Del at Conte, Texas. Yeah. And I'm not sure. I, uh, and I know Woodward's at LSU. Unless Scott Woodward. Anyway, we're going to hit a break here. When we come back on Tech Sags Radio, we're going to bank on something. Uh, I don't know what we're going to bank on, but we're going to bank on something. Right now, 12 under 12. Guys, you need to nominate somebody right now, somebody who represents Texas A&M in the most uh, positive ways. If you have graduated within the last 12 years and you're leading – by example, make sure you reach out to the Association of Former Students, former students excuse me, because they want to invite you to nominate yourself or someone you know for the 12 Under 12 Alumni Spotlight. So every year, the association recognizes a dozen Aggies who have graduated within the last 12 years for their business accomplishments, civic or military service, philanthropic efforts, and outstanding representation of Texas A&M's core values of excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, and selfless service. Previous year honorees have included leaders in business and higher education, architects, petroleum, engineers, nonprofit executives, physicians, veterans, and members of the U.S. Armed Forces. 2024 nominations close on Sunday, March 31st, so be sure to submit a nomination very soon. To learn more about the recognition and submit a nomination, visit tx.hc slash 12 under 12 nominations.
It is Tech Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We're still here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. Appreciate everybody listening in this morning. Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. It is now time to bank on it. Bank on it presented by Vera Bank. Authentic relationship-based banking built for real life. Go see Joel Jackson and the team. Learn more at verabank.com. What are you banking on, buddy? Well, you know, I kind of touched on it early. Uh, when you were uh, discussing the things you wanted to see, I am banking I'm going full in too. I mean, I'm, I'm making a huge deposit on Boots Radford going back to home to Baton Rouge, playing like we ex- uh, a performance like we expect of, uh, Boots, especially after he had a hard time up in Arkansas. Uh, I think it was two of fifteen. That's not the Boots Radford we know. I think we're going to see more of the Boots Radford that we saw against Kentucky. Uh, so I'm banking on. Tyrese Rad for going on and, and, and having a, a really, really good game. To be, he may not even be the Robin to the Batman because he may be the Superman to the Batman. So I was going to say that, but oh. I'm not going to now. I'm sorry. I'm going to do one that I hope doesn't bite me in the butt, and not because I don't believe in this guy, but I hope he's healthy. Henry Coleman then. Henry Coleman double-double. Okay. 13 points, 11 rebounds. All right. What do you think, Jackson? <laughs> Don't you love it? What's on? I hope so. <laughs> good, good answer. <laughs> yeah, look, they said on the broadcast that, he, that Henry had told the uh, broadcasting crew that he expected to yep, play right. on on uh, Saturday against LSU. So I'm going to do that. And you see his averages right there. Almost 12 points a game, about eight rebounds a game. He's going to have – he's going to go above his average. And, and you know what? That's even skewed because that game against uh, Florida Atlantic – he left early. He left early, so it still counts as a game he played. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's what I'm banking on. I am absolutely banking on Henry uh, making a, a splash. I would like you. I think you'd like Henry because, you know, he's obviously a guy that spends a lot of time in the gym, too. Henry does work out. Yeah, you yeah. can tell. I'm a big fan of the workout. Yeah, you are. I met a uh, student yesterday. He came up to me. He's like, hey, are you David Nunez? I was like, wow, that's nice of you. He's like, yeah, I listen to you guys all the time. He goes, is it true all you guys work out here? So I started explaining. I was like, well, whatever time I say I'm going to be here, Billy will be here about 45 minutes after. Mm-hmm. Ryan Bronger is usually right around the same time. He goes, what about OB? I go, oh, he'll be here around 3. Um, I was there around 3 yesterday. Mm-hmm. I know your style. I was, I was on, but I was just on the elliptical yesterday. I saw you when I was leaving. Oh, did you? I had nodded you, but you were looking straight through me. I was on my way out. I, I, I'm sorry I didn't see you. It's all right. Um, but it, it, I, I figured out everybody's kind of like their schedule. I think at SEC Media Days, uh, the Texas Continuum is probably in the, in the best physical condition. No, we, no, no, SEC Network. Local media, oh, we take anybody, yeah. no doubt. Yeah. But SEC Yeah, well, Network, they're all former athletes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, every yeah, time I'm, I'm in there, Roman Harper's going, even, he's yeah. on the treadmill going 1,000 miles an hour. Uh, Burns is in there. They're all in there. Uh, the, the receiver from Florida, the big, tall, white guy. Um, why, am I, why am I blanking on him? Uh, Who are we talking about? The big, tall, white guy. He's a receiver, uh, played receiver at Florida. Uh, he's like 6'5", and he's – I can't think of his name. Do you know who I'm talking about, Jackson? I know who you're talking about. I'm, I'm blanking on it right now. <sighs> what? Anyway, okay, never mind. Okay. Why, am I, why am I blanking on this guy? Tom Hart? No, I don't know if I've ever seen Tom Hart there. No, anyway, it'll come to me later. All right, well, re- regardless, they all work I'm talking out. about your local media type of people. Local media? Ryan Fowler, our buddy in Alabama? <laughs> uh, who else? J- uh, neighbors? Right? They all work out? OB, you're thinking about Chris Doring. Thank oh, you. Chris Doring, our friend of the show, Chris Doring. Yeah. He's 6'5? I don't know. He's really that tall? That. He may be. Listen, he may not be exactly 6'5. He's a big, tall guy. Yeah, he's tall. I mean, everybody's taller than me, but I didn't realize he was 6'5. Chris Doring's, yeah, he, he works out in the morning and in the afternoon. He's a two a dayer. <laughs> and he parties. I'll give him that. That guy, that guy has a good time. All right, uh, that's going to do it for the Go Hour here, presented by 6'4. Oh, yeah, you were right. I'll give you that. Go Hour presented by the uh, Warehouse at? Um, CC Creations. Playoffs? Playoffs. I knew you were going to do that. Our Parrot OB. Thank you, sir. Enjoy the weekend. Hopefully I see you at some point. When we come back on TechSags Radio, Mark French is going to be joining us in an awesome office because he's always in a great office. We'll get some Elite 8 checkpoints. Can we even talk about Elite 8 checkpoints? Sweet 16 checkpoints. NCAA tournament checkpoints. We'll talk to him about 
all that and get his thoughts on what they need to do against LSU. After that, super excited about uh, getting Ryan McGee on the program. Uh, you know, Marty and McGee. He's love Star Wars. Uh, I don't think we're going to talk. Great writer. Just a nice human being. He texted me back with the words, yo. Anybody who uses yo in a text, circle of trust. OB, start doing yo. Yo. All right, we'll be back with more on Tex Tex Radio. Where is he? I love this game when I play the uh, Mark French game. It's Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. You're not in Texas, right, Mark? Are you allowed to tell me where you're at? What's up? (laughs) 
or off location, Nuno. All right. Uh, no, man, I'm in uh, I'm in Colorado with some friends this weekend, so uh, got out of town uh, about a day ago. So uh, figured I'd take the call from here, but definitely wanted to connect since we uh, we missed each other last week. Well, I appreciate you, sir, and, and sorry to interrupt your good times, but I know you love talking Aggie basketball. Uh, Mark French with us here on the Brian Foley Law Hotline. So I guess we start off with, you know, I know we like to do these Elite Eight checkpoints, but do we move it back to Sweet 16 checkpoints? Do we move it to NCAA tournament checkpoints? Where are we with this team, Mark? Yeah, I, I do think this is still a, a, a tournament team, right, Nuno? Um, I do think that we probably need to alter the Elite Eight enthusiasm just a smidge, and I apologize for leading that charge. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, I think uh, the Sweet 16 isn't off the table. I think it would it would maybe surprise me. Um, a little bit, um, especially without, you know, uh, Marble and Coleman and, um, you know, it just, it hasn't come together like we necessarily thought. And so um, I do think there's enough talent and there's enough guard play to, you know, a, a round of 32 or sweet 16s on the table. But I mean, you got to fix this thing, you know, pretty quick. And uh, that win at Arkansas certainly would have, would have felt matters. So fix this thing. I don't know what the fix I mean, I, I have some ideas, Mark, but I don't know what to fix because you're not yeah. going to win a lot of games when you miss all those shots, and they consistently miss a lot of shots. So unless you find a way to get easier buckets, and, let, and let's be real honest, maybe this could be our next point. Wade Taylor has to be such a miraculous player at the end of games for them to even be back yeah. for a chance to win that, like, that is not a sustain, sustainable. So... What do you? How can they fix their issues? And I believe that they will. I just don't know the where unless they start shooting well again. Yeah, no, totally. I think you know if I think what Buzz and them are going to do is they'll point to the free throw game, right? I think uh, my stats aren't loading this morning, but I kind of have some of it from memory. I mean, I know we missed at least five down the last eight minutes. Uh, the eight minutes of the second half, there was five we missed. Um, and it's guys like Boots missing too. And I know he he came back and hit the one and, and you know, sent it overtime, all that jazz. But um, you're looking at, you know, just free points that were given up. And Buzz will – that'll drive Buzz crazy because um, – but I think they'll start with things like that. And, you know, the pointless turnovers and, and all that when really, you know, as a fan, what we want to see is, all right, is there going to be some tweak to the offense besides Wade high pick and roll? Are there going to be – and really what we're talking about there, it's not a, a, a wholesale overchange to everything. It's, it's, you know, where are the wrinkles? You know, how, how are we developing Jace Carter to become a – you know, how are we getting him in rhythm shot so that he can become instead of a six, seven, eight, nine point a game guy to, a, to be a 12, 13, 14 point a game guy? You know, it's, it's – you know, how are we getting Henry duck in post up so that he doesn't have to just do all of his work on the offensive glass? Um, you know, it's things like that. I think it's these wrinkles that, you know, I thought would have frankly been, you know, a little more, bit more uh, deeper into the bag at this point of, se of the season. Um, but I also think it's important not to panic. And, you know, college basketball is a completely different game than college football or NBA or um, uh, it, it's such a it's, – it's its own uh, insulated sport almost where what you do at the end of the season matters way more than – um, that's what everybody remembers. And so they got to get to a point where they get on a hot streak and they get some sort of what Buzz would call a crescendo and, and get into the SEC tournament. And, and they need to go win a game in the NCAA tournament this year. It's, it's year five, and Buzz is um, – he's more than capable of that. Um, so that's where I'm at. Mark, uh, I have empathy for Buzz for a couple reasons. Here is that, like, you, you have an inconsistent lineup, right? Not only from production, but like, guys are in and out. Bu uh, excuse me, Boots misses some time. He comes back. He finds his rhythm, but doesn't really. Henry's out. You know, like, people have been in and out, and it's been kind of this, this roller coaster of you're not really sure who's going to be able to play for you. And then when they do come back, what kind of shape are they in, and how long does it take them to get back? I know that's life in the SEC, but at least from that perspective, it's hard to get consistency when you have some of your main guys out. You have no idea. It's like it's it's so much different. Again, I, so many of my A and M friend, uh, friends are like just college. They're huge college football fans, and they don't understand college basketball. And it's you know you, you're talking about you really have when it comes down to it, you have eight or nine guys that play at Nuno, and so when you're talking about three or four of those being flexed out, we forget solo. Who I mean, Solo missed four. What was it? Three, four, five games. 
Um, he was the most impactful person on the floor in the Kentucky win last Saturday. And so here's what I would caution. If I had to just summarize it all, and I understand everybody's frustration, you don't hit the panic button. Let's let the, the full team, complement of team, play together, minus Marvel. So he's kind of off the table in my mind. But the last time that the whole team played, we beat can, number six, Kentucky, right? Who a lot of people are picking to be in the final four because of their guard play. So, um, and our guards outplayed them. So, and that's what wins games at the end of the year. And, and I think, um, I don't think it's time to hit the panic button. I do think uh, there needs to be some internal, you know, like what happened on the last play. Like uh, if you're going to, you know, let the best player catch the ball. Why call a timeout and let them kind of draw something up? You know, are we not, are we not going to be in a one, two, two press? These are the kind of things that the staff will evaluate. And in the moment, it's, it, it's, so, it's so easy to be, you know, Monday morning quarterback here and, and uh, critique it. Uh, it happens so fast. Um, but I, I really do believe in the staff and um, you know, that last play, it really bugged me because that those guys deserve to win, particularly Wade Taylor. Um, you're talking anytime you go get over 30 in a college game, you're cooking, you get over 40. I mean, you're, the kids should be on the top 10, top five of the wooden watch list. And, um, I think that's something you'll, you'll start to see trickle out more. Talking to Mark French here on the Brian Foley law hotline. I'm glad you brought that up because I felt like I was like by myself. I didn't love the timeout. In fact, I didn't like it at all. I would have rather, and I, and I talked to coach Tom Schubert thought here on studio and he, he explained to me the way coaches look at it, you know, it'd be better to have our defense set up. But to your point, the guy who had been beating you all game long took the game winning shot and was able to move freely. So like, I would much rather have that offense kind of scramble and think that against the clock, as opposed to come up with a play, unless you have the perfect defense drawn up. So you have a couple options and I'd look, I'd, I'd tell this buzz and I would talk through this together, right? Like he would, he would, he's open to all this stuff, you know, and it, he wants to win more than anyone. So like you have a couple options, right? So one would be to face guard the guy, uh, I forget his name, who had 35 points or whatever um, in the game winner. You face guard him there because he's been cooking the whole second half, especially the last eight minutes, the um, last two four-minute segments. So you either face guard or you send a trap right around midcourt. So he has to get off of it. They only have, I think, 7.6 seconds. So you're, you're you know, you're – you're getting him off the ball. You're making someone else beat you. Um, and then you just kind of pray. But I, it was, it was such a, um, they were out of timeouts. Um, it was such a quirky game and the momentum. It felt like Wade killed them. Like that felt like the dagger, did it not? And I think each game is different and it's a feel thing. And this is what, you know, it's so hard to, to judge from our couches, but you can kind of feel it. If you know, basketball, that was a dagger and Wade, he he nailed it. That was a it should have been an M one to be to be quite honest. Um, and that was a situation where you almost want to just rush everyone back, um, and then kind of let it be you know hubble jubble. Um, so those are a couple options you had, and I think they'll learn from it. Um, they're going to be in a lot of close games down the down the stretch, and how they perform in those will will determine how the you know how we grade the season on the on the back end. Well, let's get back to Solo for a minute because God, he makes such a difference, doesn't he? Like. I just everything he brings, his energy, and look, the way we talk about him is very similar to the way we talk about Anderson Garcia. This team is full of like these role player types, and I don't think that's a problem at all. You got, but but sometimes you got to get some guys that are also scoring dogs beyond Wade Taylor. Yeah, there's no doubt. Uh, there is a charisma. There is a um, hypo. Uh, allergetic um, enthusiasm that Solo brings. It just rubs off. It exudes. You can't quantify it. All the good stuff, right? Um, but you can quantify it because a lot of times it shows up in the final box score. When Solo plays well, the Ags win. And so um, I'll read y'all a text I sent to uh, uh, also a friend of y'all's program. I'll keep anonymous. But I said, Buzz found his rotation. Wade, Boot, Solo, Andy, Coleman. I said, uber athletic and aggressive. On paper, it looks like less shooting, but we suck at that anyway, so we might as well hit the boards. Jace Carter, Levesque, Manny, when he's on, Hefner against teams without the hyper athlete can play the supportive minute. And so you could you could interchange that, but I think those five, right, Nuno, your Wade, Boots, get your scoring punch. Solo crashes the glass, and he's a scoring punch in that 
he's going to make these weird plays that lead to buckets. You know, like Kentucky, there was three or four of them, particularly the block, and then the, it turned around and got us a bucket. Uh, Andy um, is becoming more of a reliable scorer with his touch game around the rim, and then obviously Coleman's just kind of a bellwether, and we don't have another big. Although Levesque did play play well against against Kentucky, I got to give the kid credit. Um, but if you're looking down the stretch at a five that Buzz could come to trust, he may just say, "Let's just if you know if we're already kind of leaning this one way, let's go all in." You know, because if if Jace and um, you know we got Manny shooting air balls, I hate I love the kid, but it just can't happen on national television. And then Hefner hasn't been who he was to end last year. And so at some point we have so much evidence that we have to look at the hard data and look ourselves in the mirror and say these are the guys that are going to play. And it doesn't mean I love you know you don't love those other kids less, but this is a business and this is year five and we got to go win some NCAA tournament games. So I think that'll be Buzz's rotation if I had to guess. Um, I could be completely wrong, but it looked really good against Kentucky. Mark, let's kind of look at this upcoming schedule. I, I don't want to call it an opportunity mm-hmm. because we don't know what team is going to show up, but there is an opportunity here to get somewhat right, right? So let's let's kind of go through this if, if Nick can p- pull up the schedule for us because you got LSU, and LSU is playing really good basketball. Like the, they're, they're playing at a very high level. Missouri, yeah. another winnable game. Let's kind of just talk it out because there's an opportunity here. Yeah, totally. And if y'all get it on the screen, my Wi-Fi is down. So LSU, here's the deal is uh, Coach comes over from Murray State two years ago, right? And they came in, and yeah, there it is. They kicked our tail at home, and there is no excuse for that. Um, but you got to go. You got to go trade with them there. You got to go to to Baton Rouge and get that win, right? Especially coming off the Arkansas loss, which was why that that one play had so much significance for the season. Because then you're at two and two in SEC play, and then you can kind of you maneuver, right? Now you're playing from behind, exactly what we said we didn't want to do two weeks ago. Um, LSU. They have a guard who uh, recently has been named eligible. Um, it was uh, kind of a weird situation with the NCAA. He's an older guy. Um, he's really good. He, I think Cook is his name. I could be wrong, uh, but really good player. Um, kind of a, a straw that stirs the drink type guy for them. And uh, the dominoes have kind of fallen in place. And um, Missouri, again, preseason, they were rated highly. They've kind of struggled out of the gate. Um, so, like, I mean, maybe you're, you're talking about splitting those, maybe. Um, Old Miss will be – they're overrated. Um, Chris Beard purposely scheduled a, um, an easy um, non-conference as to generate fan support. It was a smart move on his part, not knocking it. That's exactly what happened. Go If you want, go look at their schedule. If you're wondering why Old Miss is ranked number 22nd in the country, go look at their non-conference schedule and get back to me. Um, and then Florida would be kind of the last game of that four game stretch. Um, and I think that's how we should chunk it up. Uh, that's a home game. Uh, Florida's not what they used to be. Um, uh, plenty capable coach came over from San Francisco, I believe two years ago. Um, and, uh, again, there's no easy games in the SEC, but if you were to look at it and, you know, if you take these next four, we're one and three right now, you know, could we go two and two? Yes. Uh, could we go three and one? Maybe. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, wanting to be in that upper quarter of the SEC or upper half, even at this point, um, of the, of the conference standings, you know, you probably need to go three and one. Um, so, uh, I still think this is an NCAA tournament team, but I mean, by golly, that Arkansas game is just going to haunt me for the next month. Um, cause that would have been probably a quad one road win by the end of the year. Um, so Plus, it'd been nice to stick it to muscle, muscleman, huh? Mark, I, I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer here. I'm gonna kind of sound like a Debbie Downer <laughs> here, but like the Arkansas game, like again, they consistently find themselves in these huge holes, and to me, that is the story, right? Like you fall behind Iowa State and you come back. Like you fall behind against U of H and you come back and you don't win. You fall behind big against Arkansas and you, and you come back and you take the lead with seven seconds. Like to me. You can't fall behind in these 20-point holes consistently and expect to be an Elite Eight, Sweet 16, NCAA tournament, tournament team, right? This is a, so this is the conversation. Me and my, my roommate, Connor Schwartz, he actually he's from College Station, works in commercial real estate in Dallas now, and uh, he's a bigger Aggie fan than I could ever be. Kid just breathes it, lives it. Uh, 
but he was like, how is this any different than Aggie football this year? I was like, all right, calm down, first of all. <laughs> but second of all, I was like, well, you know? And so uh, one thing we, we came to and uh, uh, I decided on as my fandom, uh, especially after a Cowboys loss on Sunday, I was just taking it to the chin. Um, but I said, I don't, I don't, when it comes to my college team, I don't want to be blue collar anymore. Like blue collar just means you're not good enough to be white collar. And I said, at, at some point, the, this basketball program needs to take the jump to where we're white collar. And there's no reason for Houston, 90 miles down the road to be in the top, you know, I know they've lost a couple games, whatever, a top 10 program right now. Right. And, um, all these programs around the region have made these deep runs and there's, we have literally everything coaches, players, uh, facilities, um, everything. And it's just the ingredients haven't all come together since BK left. And I think they're really close, man. I think some of it's just the rosters deteriorated from what they thought it would be. Um, but, uh, from just a general 30,000 foot philosophy point, Nuno, that's where I'm at with it. I'm tired of, I'm tired of the, the blue collar. Let's outwork them. We're going to come from behind and be the underdog. Like, no, I want to be the alpha male in every situation, you know, whether that's, that's, that's work, life, business, whatever, like you walk into, you're walking into something like we're better than you. We're going to take this from you and we're going to go recruit better players. Our staff's going to be better. Our scheme is going to be better. Our end of game situations are going to be better. And I, you know, I, I think Buzz has a lot of that in him, but I think one thing that we're missing is these hot starts to the game and uh, where you go and just put a team away and you bury them. And uh, I, uh, I've talked a lot about, and I know we're running short on time a little bit here, but uh, I've talked a lot about like, I didn't grow up an A&M fan. I grew up deep in the heart of SEC country in Memphis. And one of the things since I've come into this family, it's been amazing, uh, but we're too nice. <laughs> And uh, there's a little bit of me, uh, look, I didn't get to where I was in, in college basketball being a 5'8", 5'9", white kid by not having a little something in my neck, right? But, like, I want the whole fan base to develop a little bit of more of a killer instinct. And we need to demand more. And that's across all sports. Um, and with Bjork leaving, we have a little bit of a, a level set here. Uh, huge fan of the new president. But it starts with guys like me and you, and it starts on shows like this but we need to develop a swagger around what we do and what we expect. And not just because of how much money we have, but because of on field and on court performance. And so when it comes to the basketball team, it's like, Hey man, let's, instead of out toughing them, how about let's just come out and execute and put them away in the first half. And so I couldn't be more on board with you and sorry for the soliloquy, but I was really fired up on Tuesday night. Cause I, I understood the magnitude at the end of the season that Tuesday night is going to play. Mark, I'm going to follow up your thoughts with my perspective of that, what you just said. I want to be the blue-collar team that evolves into the white-collar team, right? So I like having that DNA. I like having to earn it and, like, go after it. But when you are at this point of this group, with this nucleus playing together, Wade and Boots and Henry for the third year, now we're the big dogs who have proven it. Now let's freaking go. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So, like, we were the blue-collar team 24 months ago with this core group. And 12 months ago, maybe. Yeah, I think we still had some of that. But you're coming into the year with SEC preseason player of the year. You're coming in with the number 16-ranked team in the country. And this is where I would almost say, like, act like it. Show me. Prove it. You know? And so it's not that I'm against the blue-collar traits. I'm just saying that this team has enough. They've been to two straight SEC tournament finals, right? They've been in the NCAA tournament, and at some point, you got to take the leap to say, you know what, that's not even enough for us. We expect more. Therefore, we understand that mature teams bury bad teams or mediocre teams early or struggling teams like Arkansas. And that's really what I was saying. I'm all for the blue – believe me, I'm blue-collar as it gets. But when it comes to this team in particular, there's a, a standard that I wish they would hold themselves and play up to a little bit higher. Mark, I appreciate you, sir. Thanks so much, all right? All right, guys. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Enjoy your trip, buddy. Take care. Mark French there on the Brian Foley Law Hotline. We'll hit a break. We'll come back with Around the SEC and some thoughts on what Mark had to say there. Uh, right now, Millican Reserve Time, a farm-to-table community in College Station. They got homes. They got trails. They got a wide open space out there. And their mission is to build a healthy community around nature. And they've done that by uh, creating the sanctuary for family, for nature, and for each other. Dedicated to the conservation of a healthy community. Respect for that native landscape and wildlife. 2,600 acres of open space, 
farms and trails and homes. Millican Reserves, Millican Reserve, excuse me, connects families to nature and to each other. They have an extensive network of trails throughout a wooded landscape that includes walking and equestrian paths, creeks and ponds and gathering areas, and they're committed to maintaining and restoring that natural habitat. Millican Reserve provides a natural setting for people to connect to each other, and you can do that by hiking, by biking, by canoeing, kayaking, equestrian trails that are out there, evening yoga, the summer camps, you name it, they have it all at Millican Reserve. And you can find them online at millicanreserve.com. Again, that website, millicanreserve.com. Go check it out. Hey, David, can you replicate uh, those moves you're just doing back here, please? Thank you. Which one? The like, Just the, the moves. You're, there you go. Yeah. yeah. What's that? The cobra strike? That's it's kind of it like, like the cobra strike, but it's like taking you to the ground and then, I don't know, oh, of course. pressure it's, to your it's throat. It's fighting. It's, yeah. Got it. Here's the truth. Shout out to Brazos Valley MMA, my friends there. Here's the truth. I think I'd do pretty well in an MMA tournament against untrained human beings that my size are smaller. That's what I think. If you've been trained at all, you'll kick my butt. That's, that's the reality, except anybody in this office. I mean, you basically just said I can take on like a group of 12-year-olds 
You, you could beat him in a fight. I'm 47, Nick. Yeah. People younger than me, that's the entire city. I feel like a grandpa in College Station. I know there's older people than me, but I like everywhere I'm at, I feel like I'm the oldest guy in here. In Houston, I never felt that way. Here, like, oh, who's, who's the narc? That's what it feels like. <laughs> narc? Nah. Hey, what's the name of this show? Tex Ags Radio. We are presented by who? David Gardner Jewelers. You're inside the Rollo Insurance Studio. I'm not. Well, technically, aren't we all? When we're in College Station, this is Rollo country, baby. That, well, yeah, very true. Uh, I want to do around the SEC here in a second, and then we're going to have, uh, I'm r- really looking forward to Ryan McGee here on the program uh, after that. But that interview or that conversation with Mark French got me pumped up because I think he's exactly right. I like being the blue-collar team. Like, I love that. But I want to be the blue-collar team that is like, that we we evolve from that with those same principles, but we dominate our opponent, right? Not our blue-collar team that, hey, they they fight every every game. They're in it because they fight hard. I don't care. Like, I care. I care but I want more for this particular group. I understand that there's a cycle, as I break the microphone, of, you know, like a young team, then you kind of grow into the next level, and, oh, hey, you, you're knocking on the door of the tournament, you're in the tournament. Like, the, I want the next level. I don't want to keep reaching the same level or a little bit below. There's a lot of time left in this season. And hopefully, consistency in the lineup will help out Wade Taylor and will help out production. But until then... You know, we're now at this point like, is it going to be good enough? Because now LSU's not a guaranteed win. The, none of these games are guaranteed wins anymore. When I used to look at that schedule, like, look at all these games that A&M should get. All right, let's, uh, let's go back to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Jackson Moss has got uh, around the SEC for us. Yeah, so we, uh, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier in the show, but uh, 25 Alabama players have entered the transfer portal since Nick Saban retired. Uh, I know Olin was talking about Caleb Downs a little bit earlier. He's the number one player in the transfer portal now. He actually had 107 tackles, which is the first freshman to lead Alabama in tackles since 1970. And then uh, also Washington quarterback Austin Mack plans to follow Kalen DeBoer to Alabama. Uh, With them having problems with depth, this is going to be huge for them. And Uh, then I had a quick question for you, David. And I got a a long answer for you. (laughs) What is your quick fix to the crazy world of NIL and transfer portal uh, now? If you could change things like... If you had to change three things by tomorrow, what would you do? First thing I would change, and I know it looks like uh, the government's not going to help me out on this one since um, you know they're just going to sue the NCAA for this transfer portal, but I would not allow immediate transfers. I definitely wouldn't allow unlimited transfers, but I would not allow immediate transfers in, in college football. I'd go back to the way it used to be because what I think it does is it entices people who are happy at their program to go search for money every year. And, and I understand that that's the kind of, you know, that's democracy, right? But I think there needs to be a little bit more guardrails there. There needs to be some kind of contract. Uh, you know, there was a former Aggie player who was talking about his NIL deal here. Like, look, th- there should be a little bit. We all know that NIL is not supposed to be involved in the recruitment of a player, but it is. So let's just be honest about it and, and set some contracts and set some stipulations that you have to be at a program for a minimum of a couple of years or you can't transfer after your freshman, until after your sophomore year. Some, some kind of rule, right? Uh, so I, that's, that's the first thing I would do. I think I would the easiest fix is for football to break away and create a super league. And it doesn't have to be only 30-some teams. It can be a bigger super league that where the um, lower revenue sports – are kind of in a different world. We go back to regional conferences, right? That they don't have to follow the football, you know, structure. I would do that. So I would would allow for less transfers, some kind of contracts, and I would have football break away into its own entity to where you can have contracts, right? Not that you can be traded and, and to that expect, but college football to me, one of the beauties of it is being able to see a guy grow freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, to senior year, right? And, and sure, you should be able to transfer if it's not a good fit after a while. But all that development for some of the smaller schools to just lose it, I've said this many times. I love it when it helps A&M, but if we're talking about the greater good of college football, that's kind of how I would handle it. All right, let's hit a break here. We'll come back. We're going to talk to Ryan McGee. Marty and McGee, you know that show. That guy's awesome. 
Uh, he was just uh, recently at a NASCAR event, um, reporting out of there. He wrote a great article about Nick Saban. So we'll talk about all that stuff and, and the stuff going on here at Texas A&M. Right now, though, don't replace it. Lift it. If you've got you know concrete situations that you are thinking about replacing your driveway or maybe your patio or, or parts of your business, you don't have to replace it. That is super expensive. Replacing your driveway can be ten to fifteen thousand dollars. You can do it for a fraction of that cost by just lifting it. That's what Ascend Lift uh, does out there. Ascend Concrete Lifting and Support. Brian Dickerson is an Aggie. He owns and operates it all, and he's he and his business have been doing it for a long, long time. They have done professional construction work for over sixty plus years there, and they're going to educate you on the lifting process. That number is 979-933-8527. They will provide an honest opinion of whatever situation you have, residential, commercial, industrial. We're talking bridges and curbs and roads and streets and highways. We're talking factory floors, apartment complexes. We're talking about your own house out there. Again, that number, 979-933-8527, or you can follow them on Facebook or Instagram, 979-933-8527. Don't replace it. Lift it with Ascent Concrete Lifting and Support. It's not often when you meet somebody, they live up to their reputation in real life, right? Uh, there's certain guys that in the media, I'll just use as an example, they're really nice. And then you meet them, they're not as nice, not our next guest. In fact, uh, our next guest and his, his uh, television partner are some of the nicest human beings in the world. Let's go to the Brian Foley Law Hotline. We're joined by Ryan McGee here on uh, Tech Sags Radio. Ryan, what's up, man? How you been? 
I'm good. I, I appreciate you saying that about me, but I'm not going to tell Marty you said he was really nice. I'm just going to keep that to myself. <laughs> you guys are great, man. And uh, we share in a love of uh, – you're bigger. I'm, I'm into superheroes and Star Wars. I know you're big into Star Wars. So at some point we're going to have to talk about – I have not watched Ahsoka yet, but I, I, I am all in on Mando. It's so good. Ahsoka's so good, and it, it's worth watching. I mean, I believe it's episode four. It's worth watching just for the middle episode because it's uh, – it was uh, it's something else, and, and I just finished uh, Echo, the new Marvel uh, show on Disney Plus, and it's good. It's Echo. Uh, you don't don't watch that with your kids. That one gets a little rough, but it's uh, but it's good. So yeah, no, it's it's funny. My daughter's nineteen, and uh, she's a freshman at another SEC school, and uh, but she and I talk all the time. I tell her all the time. I hope you appreciate the fact that I always love Star Wars. And I always loved Marvel, but you know we had no Marvel movies, and we had one Star Wars movie every three years, maybe. And now it's just constant content. So good for her, good for her generation, because uh, and good for me too, and you. That's right, man. I don't care. I'm 47 years old. I'm still all in. I don't care. No, I literally, I'm sitting in my office in Charlotte, and there are four lightsabers hanging on the wall. <laughs> like, like I'm, I'm the easiest. Like Christmas present of all time. I got like a Darth Vader Pez dispenser for Christmas and a Darth Vader coffee maker. So yeah, I'm I'm the easiest Father's Day slash birthday slash Christmas present ever because I'm basically twelve. Hey, one last entertainment thing before we get to football. Uh, Nate Bargazzi, I saw you went to the the concert. How was it? Because I love that dude. It was amazing. You know what's crazy is so and, and so I saw I saw Tom Papa uh, on Friday night with my wife, and then I saw Nate Bargazzi on. Sunday, and I saw Tom Papa in like this cozy theater with about a thousand people. Bargatze sold out the Spectrum Center in Charlotte, two shows, twenty-two thousand people for a comedy show. So I, that was the first for me. He's so good, man. He, yeah, and you talk about meeting guys that you hope they are as nice as you think they're going to be. You know, Nate was knocking around uh, SEC Media Days in Nashville last summer, and I was kind of starstruck. And he's exactly who you think he's going to be. Like he's just, he's just, a, he's just a dude. And when he's up there talking about, you know, not knowing how to pay property taxes and uh, being addicted to using Afrin, and I'm like, I'm 50 years old, dude. I feel all that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Hey, uh, you know, when we texted, one of the things I appreciated was you started your sentence with yo, because I love to start off things with yo. Uh, and then you continue to talk about, there's not a lot to talk about it at A&M, but actually there is with Bjork heading yeah. to Ohio State and Coach Elko. So just, uh, I'll let you start from there. Just, what do you think about the job Coach Elko has done so far? Well, I mean, listen, the, the challenge of the job is the fact that the job never ends. I mean, it's, I, I think it's why Nick Saban just retired. I, I think it's why we're not going to see guys coaching into their late 60s and 70s once Mac Brown retires. I think that's done. Like, I, I just think the, the job is too hard. And it's not too hard for Mike Elko. Um, you know, he's such a detailed guy. Uh, clearly, he understands the transfer portal. Um, you know, I mean, even in a place like Duke, he was able to bring guys in with ridiculous academic restrictions. Um, and was able to keep guys from leaving. And so, and, and clearly he's done a great job with that so far. So he's a detail oriented guy. Um, but, but, but also just a good guy. I mean, you know, I live here in North Carolina and I actually grew up, uh, on tobacco road up in Raleigh. And there's a lot of really sad people, uh, in the state where I'm standing right now, because Mike Elko is no longer up the road, but, but he's, he just gets it. You know, I, I, and I think that, that, um, the most curious part of, of the of the Jimbo Fisher experience was that, that Jimbo seemed to be all in on being a Texan, but not necessarily all in on like doing the things you have to do to be a, a college football coach in the state of Texas. And I'm and you know what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about you know talking to the high school guys. That's it. I mean, it, it's such a huge part of the job. And Mike Elko is a master at that. So. I think the potential is through the roof. And and, um, and then to get into the other part of it, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I like Ross. Um, you know, obviously I, I've dealt with Ross at Ole Miss, and he dealt with some really difficult situations. Um, the last time I saw him was on the campus at A&M when we were uh, in town doing Marty McGee and sweating through my suit uh, back, I think it was like week three. And, um, and but, but, it's, but it also felt like this was probably a good move for everyone at this point. And so uh, – yeah, a few headlines coming out of College Station. Yeah, no doubt about that. In the last segment, 
uh, one of our associates here asked me what I how I would fix this whole NIL world, and the the thing that I said was I wanted to see college football break free and and still limit the transfers, even though that looks like that's not going to happen. Somebody responded that would kill the other sports. So, I mean, do you have an idea that you think could potentially work? Because nothing's working, but it's working. No, and and the problem is. There's just, there's no, yeah, I, I say this all the time. I always quote Jason Priestley from Tombstone. You know, there's got to be some sort of law, right? And there's no rules. And so now we're going to, I, I had a preacher back in North Carolina when I was growing up that used to always say, you can't unscramble that egg and you can't put the water back in the faucet. And, and it's kind of where we are with an IL. So you can't reel it all back in. Everybody needs to give up on that. But you have to figure out a way to kind of put bumpers on it. And, you know, what what's, going to happen is is that when the Nick Sabans of the world are retiring or when coaches start leaving college football to go coach in the NFL because it's easier, which I know words I never thought I would say, but that's going to start happening soon, um, like very soon. Um, you know, that, that's when you realize you got to fix something. And I'm, I'm not sure what the plan was here. And, and Greg Sankey, the commissioner of the SEC, is on this, I call it the future of, of sports committee. You know, this kind of master NCAA committee they put together a couple of years ago to help navigate these things. And they just kind of threw their hands up on NIL and on transfer, like, all right, you know, whatever, y'all just do what you want to do. Because, you know, everybody was fighting over it, and there wasn't a plan. And now we're waiting on government, like local and federal governments, to figure this out. It's never going to happen. So they need to reel it in now because I just worry about burnout. And I worry about, you know, I'm telling you right now, the reason Nick Saban retired is because he don't want to deal with this stuff. And and he did and did it very well. But but you can't keep that up. You can't sustain that over an extended period of time. And so when we start running the biggest name coaches out of the sport, whether they retire or whether they go to the NFL, um, you know, now you got a real problem. How much grace do you think Alabama fans are going to give Kalen DeBoer this first year, considering all the people leaving? And he'll get his he'll get some guys back, no doubt about it. But what kind of grace following Nick Saban will he get? None. The fan base is going to cut him zero slack, zero slack. And I and I know this because you know I understand we're it's a different time and it's a different era and all those things. But all I know is is that Bill Curry. Uh, one of my favorite people I ever worked with at ESPN, Bill Curry, won the SEC, went to the Sugar Bowl, beat Auburn and Tennessee, and got a brick thrown through his window and got fired. So it, it's just it is what it is. And, and you know, and, and when I would talk to other coaches about taking this job, and if Alabama calls, you take the job. As simple as that. You know, you just do it. But but the the what a lot of coaches said to me, multiple coaches said to me, was you never want to be the guy that follows the guy. And then another guy said to me, but it's okay to be the guy who follows the guy who follows the guy. So I, I like Kalen DeBoer a lot. I don't know him that well. Um, I purposely, um, at the national championship game, spent time kind of hanging out by his booth at media day because I wanted to um, I wanted to get a feel for him. I'm crazy about him. I grew up on small college campuses, and the fact that this guy was coaching the NAIA 14 years ago. And his defense, defense coordinator was the head coach at Montana Tech five years ago. And now these guys are in, in Tuscaloosa. Um, I'm rooting for him. I hope that it works because I think it would be great just for small college coaches uh, to be able to look at those guys and go, all right, you know, I can do this if I want. But they're not going to cut him in slack. I mean, no different than I – I mean, you tell me, I don't believe – I was reading some stuff uh, earlier this week about A&M, and everybody's like, well, you know, the heat's not on him like it was on Jimbo because of the expectation level. I don't I, – I've been to College Station. I'm pretty sure that their expectation level is still pretty high. Uh, I don't think they're going to cut Mike Elko slack if suddenly he has a bad transitional year. Um, he's going to get fired if he has a bad year, but I think that um, uh, somebody's going to get the kerosene out and pour it on his feet. Yeah, no, I think the patience depends on like how many wins, right? Like I think you just better be right. better than eight and four, right? And 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 that's to open the right. door, and then from that point, you got to be a double digit win team pretty much every year. Yeah, and then there's the danger if you if you have too much success too early. It's funny because I'm, I'm you know this I'm a Tennessee alum, and I kind of went through this with my Tennessee people, which was you know 
the good news is is that uh, you know the, the coaching staff was ahead of schedule a year ago when they beat Alabama and you know and had a, a Heisman Trophy candidate until he got mm-hmm. hurt and and had a chance to make the playoff late in the season until they had that loss to South Carolina. Um, and the problem is everybody expects that again this year. But, but but anyone who really knows football knows there was a lot of construction work that was still to do. Brian Kelly's always told me about that, about at at, Tech, at Notre Dame. You know, he got Notre Dame in the BCS championship game, what, you know, like year two or three. And, and that team overachieved, and he knew it, and knew he still had work to do. And so the expectation level was to the roof. So, yeah, if if the, the college football tooth fairy – uh, came tonight and told Texas A&M fans, here's nine wins and a New Year's Day bowl game and maybe second place, third place in the division, if we still had division, then uh, I think you would say thank you very much. I'll take that in 2024 and then uh, expect more in 2025. 100%. Hey, let me uh, close out with this. Tell us a little bit about Welcome to the uh, Circus of Baseball, the, the, the book you put together. Uh, well, I appreciate you mentioning it. Yeah, that book was a labor of love for me, um, and it's been so much fun in, in 2023 kind of putting it out there and promoting it. But I, I worked in minor league baseball for one summer. Um, I have been obsessed with minor league baseball my entire life. If you, if you watch Marty McGee on Saturday mornings, and you know I wear a different minor league baseball cap on the show and have for three years and haven't repeated one yet, much to my wife's chagrin because they've taken over my house. But the uh, But I love it. I love minor league baseball so much. You know, again, growing up in North Carolina, it's kind of like Texas. There was a time when I was a kid in the 80s, it felt like every town in North Carolina had a minor league baseball team. And so I spent the summer working for the Asheville Tourist, uh, McCormick Field. If you've seen Bull Durham, it's, it's the old ballpark where Crash Davis hits his last home run at the end of the game. And I did everything from wear the mascot uniform to I almost got killed trying to uh, fill the Dairy Queen machine, uh, the tarp. At one point, I flew 10 feet up in the air. Um, and, and I put all these stories into a book, and it's really just a love letter, you know, to minor league baseball. And um, and man, y'all got some great ballparks and teams around the state of Texas. I I literally plan my travel, um, particularly in the summertime, around the minor league baseball schedule, and and I collect minor league ballparks. And so um, hopefully, uh, I've done right by the people who spent their entire life working for our entertainment at these ballparks uh, with Welcome to the Circus of Baseball. Ryan, man, I appreciate your time so much. Thank you very much, and let's do it again, all right? Hey, call me anytime. I appreciate it, man. Take care, buddy. Ryan Thanks. McGee there on the uh, Brian Foley Law Hotline. Love that conversation. We will talk Star Wars with him. Sorry, guys, for those of you who don't get it. We will talk Marvel. We will talk football. We will talk comedy. You name it. All right, a moment now for Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 and Caldwell Online. CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com. They got great deals on their website. They're fantastic, right? When you need a vehicle, you go to their website, CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com, and you get a search for what they have, right? You, you see the pricing, the vehicles that they have, and uh, just uh, also just you, you've heard me talk about the customer service experience when you go there. You're going to be blown away. You're going to get there, and you're going to be blown away of what they can do for you, right? The price that you're going to get on your trade-in, the price on the vehicle, and then the entire experience itself, even after you've bought that vehicle, you're going to love it because they took care of me. They've taken care of Billy. They've taken care of so many others here at Texax. I'm telling you, you will love the experience. It's about a 15-minute drive. Brian to Caldwell, short conversation away, but you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the good people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 in Caldwell, online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com.
All right, want to make sure everybody knows that uh, Holly there at Costa Vida, they're celebrating today their four-year anniversary, so they're having a ribbon cutting. They weren't able to do it in 2020 uh, because of obvious reasons. They couldn't have uh, large gatherings out there, but come su support and celebrate. I know a bunch of the Tex Ag staff will be there, um, so make sure you go there, and they're trying to focus on healthy eating out there. So today from 1130 to 12 o'clock, they'll have chips and queso and a lunch special to offer as well. The Tex Ag community, a big part of what they do. Go say hi to Holly there in uh, South College Station at Costa Vida, 4501 Mills Park Circle in College Station, Aggie owned and operated, the friendliest staff, the best people, the most fresh food out there. You want to go check it out. It is Costa Vida. Looking forward to uh, seeing all the great food and the, uh, the times that they have out there. Right now, it's time for Around Aggie Land, presented by Norman G. State Bank. Norman G. State Bank, rock solid banking. The website is normangstatebank.com. We've got Kay Nagley. You spewed through that, man. That was probably 500 words right there. That's what I tried to do, yo. <laughs> You're just so you can do it. And See, I, but, go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. No, I was just doing that to oh, do that. Okay, you're just doing that to get more words in. Is that what you would say? I, I always have to have the last word. <laughs> oh, true, very true. Let's, let's let's get right to it. I have a lot of words to speak today. Let's go. Uh, starting off, Mike Elko. Every week I come in here has a new guy just reeled in. This time it is cornerback Desmond Ricks, former Alabama cornerback. As I said, um, he has announced his plans to join A&M next season. He was once a five-star prospect, um, played in two games for the Tide, and arrives as a red shirt freshman. So we'll have a lot of eligibility. That's good for Mike Elko and company as well. A pair of future Aggies will play in the Polynesian Bowl tonight. Night. On NFL Network at 8 p.m., Jordan Lockhart and Ascendra Papa Afua will be playing at 8 p.m. Like I said, make sure to check that out if you want to see a couple, couple of guys or future guys in maroon and white. Uh, moving on to some men's basketball. Unfortunately, Wade Taylor had pretty much the game of Texas a and I mean, pretty much history. His 41 points were the most by an Aggie since an since. A&M joined the SEC, 41, but unfortunately, Arkansas did, despite A&M coming back, Arkansas did spoil the game uh, as A&M fell in the final literal second, 78-77. Uh, to se 78-77. Um, they will play LSU, looking for a little revenge on the road. Women's basketball has a big one. Their biggest te test yet, actually, is number one, South Carolina. Will come to town. Uh, that's going to be a big one. That's a 4 p.m. tip um, on Sunday on SEC Network. One of the best defenses in the country, A&M, top three. Yeah. South Carolina, top three in offense. It's going to be – I don't know. I'm excited. I, I am will excited say this. to get there. The last time A&M took on a team with one of the top offenses in the country was mm -hmm. LSU. Didn't go mm -hmm. A&M's way. Yeah. That was on the road. Yeah. This is at home. That's true. You, you get Reed Rowdy? It can be I'm, a Rowdy. Like, seriously. They are undefeated can, at home. Let's keep it, it going. Can change a, it can change a lot of the game. Um, additionally, this weekend, we got going on track and field. We'll return to action to host the Ted Nelson Invitational. Arizona State, Clemson, and Houston. And then we got some tennis as well. But that's all for around Aguilin. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate you, Kay. Of course. When we come back. Nick Savage taking over the show. I've got to take care of some family stuff. Appreciate everybody. Uh, but Nick will take over the show. Billy Lucci will be here momentarily. That, your text messages, and all the analysis you can imagine, uh, it is Tex Ags Radio.
Welcome back in. Tech Sags Radio presented by David Garner Jewelers. We're here inside the Rollo Insurance Studio. David peeling out a little bit early. Nick Savage here filling in for him the rest of the way. We'll have Tech Sags co-owner Billy Lucci in studio here shortly. We'll get into uh, all kinds of different things. Update on the athletic director search. Uh, look at the Texas A&M football roster, how it's kind of shook out, uh, especially with a couple new additions this past week. Um, and, and look ahead to that LSU basketball game coming up this Saturday. But for now, we're going to go over to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center and check in with Jackson Moss. Jackson, you got any uh, notes for us? Yeah, uh, just a couple things. I got men and women swimming and diving take on LSU tomorrow at 10 a.m. And also, uh, Texas A&M is hosting the Ted Nelson Invitational tomorrow for track and field starting at 2 p.m. Nice. Right on. Luke Evangelist is taking over for me behind the glass. Luke, are you there? Are you settled in? Are you ready to speak to me? Oh, yeah. I'm definitely settled oh, yeah. in. You know, a couple Look at minutes that. ago. Even with the quick camera flip. Shout you know out to Zoe doing. for that. Dream team. Oh, you told her. Okay, um, so, nice. yeah, back. I was just back there helping the interns, and now I'm up here. This is the quickest promotion I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> um, Richard almost hit me with a bat. I do have something to talk about. I don't believe it's been mentioned Let's yet. Let's get into it. Uh, women's basketball hosting number one South Carolina yeah. in Reed Arena this weekend, Sunday. It's a whiteout. I think this is the biggest home game for Joni Taylor in her entire time. Richard's hitting me with the ball now. Her entire time at A&M, this is what her entire program has been leading up to. They're 14-3 and three this year. They're absolutely killing it. They had nine wins all of last year, and now they get the number one team in the country undefeated coming into their barn so if you're in town make sure to come out to Reed arena on sunday to see that what time is the game 4 p.m tip off 4 p.m tip off uh thank you okay for the quick response it's on sec network if you can't make it but please come out and support joni taylor they've got an incredible team this year and she's building an incredible program absolutely the aggie women's basketball team sitting in fifth in the conference standings with a two and two record uh, South Carolina, obviously, like you said, number one team in the nation. They're four and zero in conference, sixteen and zero overall. So they got it rolling. But like you said, big opportunity for Joni Taylor to make a big time statement uh, for her. And it looks like Billy Lucci called in. So that means guys at the zone, can y'all please put him on air for me? And uh, we'll go to the Brian Foley Law hotline here and check in with Texas co-owner Billy Lucci. Billy, good morning. Nikolai, what's up, buddy? Oh, nothing much. Just making it through, trying to get to the weekend. So, uh, as David likes to say, where do you, you like to start with it? I'm, I'm going off of his notes here, but uh, we can start with athletic director no. talk. Uh, he wants to get into the strongest position groups. Uh, you take it wherever you'd like. We'll start. I guess you could start with some AD talk because I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot this week that's just patently false. Uh, on the uh, on the interweb, on various message boards, on social media, private chat, whatever you may say, I've seen a lot of misinformation going around. Mm -hmm. Not just about AD. I've seen it going around um, in terms of the transfer portal. People getting their hopes up about guys that ain't them. Uh, in a couple instances, were never in on. A couple instances, did not pursue. Um, I've seen the name Carl Scott, full mile Emerson, uh, Minnesota Vikings QB's coach, who was never, uh, never an option, never on the table, and that was one that people are kind of getting everybody gassed up for. Hey, former Alabama assistant NFL guy, not an option, and uh, somehow people are posting with with Aggies attached to their. Uh, name on social media and saying it was done and the guy was coming and it gets everyone gassed up for that. That's ne That was never true, never close to true. Nothing about it was true. And then, you know, I'm, I'm hearing names on an AD search um, and there's none, none to be had yet. So any name you hear is a lie. Uh, it's just made up. Um, you can use common sense and you can name some people that might be considered both internally and, and, I mentioned, I mentioned Stephanie Ramphy from uh, Nevada, former Scott Woodward assistant. You can name people that you think will be candidates, but don't say that anyone is yet because 
anyone can be and everyone will be. I think they're going to do an actual search. Here's the update. I believe that uh, you know, President Welsh is going to he's going to uh, put together a search committee, an actual search committee, internal, meaning a collection of the right people at A&M, a good cross-section, so it's not biased any one way, and you're getting a lot of information and feedback from all sides, and I think they're going to be an actual search committee, and they're going to go out, and uh, I, don't, I don't want to say take their time, like it's going to take a month or months or weeks or whatever, I don't think it's going to drag out, but I don't think there's a rush for them to have someone hired this week. Uh, so they're going to put together a search committee, and they're going to go everywhere from probably on this campus, coast to coast, and try to find the the, the perfect fit for to, to get this athletic department, I think, where it should be to break some tendencies and patterns in terms of uh, – just an AD being an AD and, and doing exactly what he or she's brought here to do and uh, everyone else doing their jobs. So I do think it's a it's an important hire. I think A&M Athletics has become pretty damn stagnant. I, I, get, I have a hard time saying that sometimes because I look at so many of these young coaches that I'm so excited about. Um, but it, the, the the ones that I'm really excited about are so young, it's hard. But if you look around the department, the bottom line is the bottom line. And it, they, they haven't been fiscally responsible. And, yeah, a lot of that you can attribute probably to – there's a long list of reasons, okay? But they haven't been fiscally responsible, and uh, they're not winning. It's hard to be both. You know, you spend all this money, and then you still don't win. Uh, and I know there are exceptions. There are exceptions in these sports. You know, you look at baseball two years in under slosh. You look at Chadwell and, and um, women's golf. You look at women's tennis is absolutely elite uh, uh, under Mark Weaver. But, but the exceptions are few and far between. For all the sports, and so yeah, A and M is underachieving. I believe as an athletic department, and you need to ask yourselves, you know, why, and then how do we fix it? And in order to fix it, you have to understand the why as well. So there's going to have to be. A, I love the idea of a committee to sit down, uh, get a lot of different opinions, and go from there. I think to me, to me, that's the that's the right approach, and that's how they're going to do it. So I heard. You know, I had five people tell me that, sorry, here comes a helicopter. I had five people tell me that Scott Strickland at, at Florida was interviewing this week. Five different people. I had people from three different states tell me that. It's not true. It was zero, zero percent true. Bronny's trying to tell me that. Not true. Your Florida guys sometimes suck with info. Not true. So, uh, and I'm kidding. Don't cut poor Bronny off from the Florida pipeline. But that's just not, it was inaccurate from the start. And yet it spread like wildfire. Same thing with this um, Carl Scott as DB's coach. Never true. Spread like wildfire. So the truth is, search committee, they're going to really vet this thing out and try to make the best hire possible. And I don't think, I, I don't think, I know, I know there's not a specific lean towards like, oh, do we want to go with someone that knows A&M and really understands the, this place and all the different trappings that come with it to be able to navigate it and kind of figure and understand what's held the place back? I do think there's plenty of value in that. Or do you go outside and say, we're just going to go try to hire the absolute best athletic director we can hire and there's something to be said for that too absolutely talking to billy lucci here on the brian foley law hotline kind of just going back to the the search committee part that's interesting just i i want to get your thoughts how, how has that compared to searches in the past i know agents get involved in that and just in terms of what's happened in the past when it comes to new hi, hiring new ad's just how does that compare Say that again, Nick. I'm sorry. I 
I received a message, and I believe it was a quote of something Bonnie had said, uh, or maybe perhaps on radio, that just absolutely threw me. I'm gonna, I'll read it on air uh, in a minute when I get in there. Can okay. you please repeat the question? I, I was just saying, and then go to a break, and then go to a break because we're here. Okay. Well, you want me to break now, and then you can come on in. No, no, go ahead. Okay. I, I was again. just saying, what in terms of, you know, you mentioned the search committee and how that's uh, a step in a different direction. How has that compared to AD searches in the past here at A&M? Well, first of all, I don't know that it's different than anything in the past. I just know that it's what I think is necessary right now to change kind of the way, the, the change the result. I don't mean uh, the process, but I do know there was no search committee to hire Ross Bjork. That was, uh, for all intents and purposes, I mean, I'm of the belief, and I believe I'm absolutely correct, uh, that was Jimbo Fisher and Jimmy Sexton kind of handpicked him. And he was a Sexton guy, and and Ole Miss, you know, it's kind of like here with Ross. I mean, look, there's a lot of good things to say about Ross, and there's a lot of truth, too, which is, he got out before the posse at Ole Miss and a good job at A&M, which was a step up. And he got out before the posse at A&M, took a step up to Ohio State. And, and people that say, why is that a step up? I'm not saying that this, this is a terrific job here at A&M. Uh, there is a reputation that there's a lot of, of meddling done, you know, in terms of with the athletic director, and that's something they're going to have to overcome. But it's a terrific job. And if you... But if you're being honest, like you ask anyone outside of Texas A&M around the country, you say, what's a better AD job? Most people would say Ohio State. Um, I think this this spot is underappreciated in a million different ways. But I also think Ohio State, you know, you've got to be honest when you say that's an incredible job. So I think he's he knew he was about his time was about done at Ole Miss and jumped on board, you know, Jimbo and Sexton threw him a life raft, and that's what a good agent does, and he took it. Uh, and it, I think that happened again here, but there was no search there. Um, I don't remember the Scott. I don't remember the Scott uh, Woodward one. I don't remember, like, mm-hmm. uh, how that one went down or Eric Hyman. Uh, so I, I don't know, but I know that right now, I think it's exactly what A&M means. Thank you, Billy. Billy will join us here in studio on the other side of the break. You're listening to Texags Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
Welcome back in. Tech Sags Radio presented by David Garner's Jewelers. We're inside the Rollo Insurance Studio. Nick Savage here filling in for David Nuno. Billy Lucci is in the building. He'll be in studio shortly. We'll uh, touch on the safeties coach, see if there's been any progress made there. Uh, I know he's got a brawny tr- uh, text or something to read that he mentioned. Uh, but yeah, we'll get into that and more as well as Aggie Hoops coming up this weekend, taking on LSU as Billy comes into studio. Morning, Billy. What are you wearing? Navasota. Oh, I thought that was a Detroit Lion. No, no, no. I would if I had a a Detroit Lion. You know what, Nick? I just spilled coffee everywhere. You know what? I would love to get you a Detroit Lion one Mm -hmm. just to piss Zane off. Yeah, I figured that's where that was going. So if I go up there this weekend, I will return with some kind of swag for you. Yeah, how uh, how do you think that one's going to shake out for Dan Campbell and the boys? I mean, I know what I hope happens, but <laughs> that's a tough game. Yeah, you know, Mike Evans and the boys mm-hmm. from Tampa Bay are playing really good, and just from talking to people in Detroit, I think everyone knew that if the Eagles could get by that game, like that Philly had kind of Philly had kind of cashed it in. Yeah. And you'd almost have wanted them to, even though they were the better team over the six, 17 game schedule, you'd have wanted them to kind of eke their way through another round because they were just ready. They were ready, you know, to have the dagger stuck in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tampa Bay is the opposite. You know, they're starting to really believe Baker Mayfield, uh, Mike Godwin, and that offense does enough. Mm-hmm. Baker's had a hell of a year. And. There are a lot of dudes on that team that won a Super Bowl still. Yeah. And their defense, with the big man in the middle, Vita. Is it Vita? Vita Vea. Vita think, Vea. Yeah. I always want to say Vea Vita. <laughs> Vita Vea is, I mean, you kind of play Tampa Bay right now. You go into a game knowing you can't run the football very well. Mm-hmm. That's never a good feeling. Yeah. When you know, like, we probably won't be able to run between the tackles very much. It's always hard to run outside in the NFL because of the speed. So. You go into a game thinking, man, I don't know how well we're going to be able to run the football, factually. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that, all, that in and of itself makes it dangerous. So <clears throat> I think Detroit will win it at home in that environment, but that's a tough, tough game. Yeah. I think that's a tough football team. The Niners have kind of a similar situation with the red-hot Green Bay squad right mm-hmm. now. You yep. know, They're the better team, San Fran, but <clears throat> there's some things about that matchup that, that scare you. Yeah, Lions six and a half point favorites mm. over the Bucks coming into the, to that one, and uh, Texans Ravens quickly. Baltimore nine and a half point favorites over the Texans. They got maybe the tallest task this weekend to head into Baltimore. Yeah, I, I would say them and the Packers. Mm-hmm. You know, going up there. I and, and look, your best hope <clears throat> if you're either of those two teams is at the <clears throat> the week off. There's some little rust there mm-hmm. that the Ravens or the yeah. Niners have to shake off, but. Look, Baltimore's better than Houston. Mm -hmm. Houston is playing their best ball of the year. Stroud is the rookie of the year. Um, That defense is making plays. They're they're really – they believe. If you're Baltimore, you better not let them believe Mm in-game. And Lamar Jackson can do that. He did that, I think, to the 49ers. I know he did it to the Lions. Uh, or Buffalo, some like they they have crushed yeah. some of the teams that are still left in this thing. I mean, they have just worked them. Mm-hmm. If they don't do that to Houston, like off the rip on Saturday, on Saturday, I I think, uh, I think there's a real chance that it, that that game is Saturday, right? Yeah, because mm-hmm. Sunday is the Bills. Yep. I think there's a real chance that you'll have. Uh, that the Texans hang in that one. I would bet that that would be one of my bets this weekend would be the Texans to cover that nine and a half. Mm-hmm. I, I think they're going to be a very, they're going to be a very tough out. They don't want this thing to end. Mm-hmm. Can I see them winning? It's the NFL. So yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and Lamar Jackson's what one in three in playoff games. There's a reason behind that. That's not, he didn't play two games. He's played four of them. They've been favored probably in most of those games. He's lost three of them. I do, I, I do think there's a world in which the Texans can win that football game. I think, though, on the road, and we talk all we talk about is Lamar, and he's incredible. 
He's your league MVP. But that Ravens defense, it's not Ray Lewis, Ed Reed, and Terrell Suggs and those guys, but it is it is a damn good defense. It's one of the very best in the NFL led by Justin Matabike right there in the middle. So Texans yeah. offense will probably have a tough time. Talking to Billy Lucci here in studio on Texags Radio. Billy, let's kind of flip the script here. Was uh, talking about on air or in <laughs> writing begging for is this real? I was trying to see if this is real. Did he say, lastly, a lot of folks have contacted me about wanting to buy us a drink or meal while on our honeymoon. Again, that's an incredible gesture. It's also completely unnecessary. But if you're one of those folks, though, send me a PM. <laughs> I don't think like, that was. They didn't I'm say pretty that on sure radio. he wrote that because whoever <laughs> sent it to me, my friend, uh, vet surge, he would not. Um, he got a kick out of it. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. I, don't, I didn't know. If that was Bronny or, or Gabe in there, but oh, it was, it, they're two in the same sometimes. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, uh, that was definitely But if writing, you're one of those people, radio, yeah. definitely send me send, a PM. Send Bronny a PM, but uh, anything new? You want to the... fund my Vegas trip for Super Bowl week, feel free to DM <laughs> me. My Venmo is open. If you want to pay my rent, uh, yeah, send <laughs> yeah. me a message. Anyways. Uh... Texas raise fund, <laughs> Nick Savage. Safeties, coach. Anything yep. there? Anything uh, new? Actually, Zane, oh, man, Zane's about to, hold on, let's do this. We're going to send Zane a, uh, we're going to send Zane a nice piece of work for him to do this morning. That is edit oh, my boy. article that we're about to put out. Let's see, drafts, boom, there it is. Let's see, we're going to go Zane. Ah, this is how we put him to work. Subject, scatter shooting. Behind boom. the scenes look here. And Zane is about to... <laughs> Boom, done. Scatter shooting sent to Zane. <clears throat> All right. Now, in there is some talk about the safeties, Coach. And what I said is I believe that I think something will be done by the end of the weekend. It'll be my full expectation. I, I think Mike Oko, I, I, I said in the article, there are a couple guys he interviewed, I think, last Sunday, Monday, like, of this week. Um. By a couple, I mean two. I think he he had zeroed in on a couple guys. I've mm -hmm. said repeatedly, I think it'll be a the, he went from Wesley McGriff, who'd been in the SEC forever. I think he got here. Uh, I think him going to Alabama is great for both sides. It's kind of like Ross Bjork to Ohio State. Like he got here, I don't know how much he fit. Um, I like. I think. I think Elko kind of got a, a second crack at it. Mm -hmm. And decided, you know what, I'm going to go younger, maybe younger, hungrier, a little, uh, a little more energy juice, you know, like, and so I think you're going to look at a younger, higher there. Um, and I think you're going to see somebody that's kind of on the upswing and somebody uh, with that kind of like a budding ace in the recruiting ranks, like mm -hmm. a young up and coming recruiter, somebody that's, that's starting to earn themselves a reputation as a recruiter. How does, and maybe you can take me a little behind the scenes here, how does that work when a coach comes to a new spot and it kind of just doesn't seem like it fits right away? Like, how, how does that play well, out? Well, usually you're stuck with them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying, like, look, he was here like a week or two. It's not like, oh, man, this is a disastrous mm -hmm. hire. I mean, Auburn wanted him back. Yeah. Obviously he was doing something right. I don't mean it like that. I just mean, yeah, but like, it's kind of like recruits when they get here as freshmen. You can kind of tell. You can't tell exactly what, but you can tell right away when it's really right, like Christian Kirk or Miles Garrett or, you know, they, they thought that about some of those guys in that 22 class that have, that have really panned out. Like there are certain guys that when they get here, you're just like, okay, yeah. Anias was one of those guys, even though he was a three-star. Um, but – in the way of coaches, Nick, I mean, you're kind of, if they're the opposite of that, you, you signed them. Mm -hmm. So I think he would have worked out fine. He's a veteran, you know, experienced pro. But um, I think he was more of the Bradley Dale Pivato. Um, trying to think of who they had. Like Bradley Dale. Uh, who's another long time 
kind of SEC, uh, not John Chavis, he was like that too, but Bradley Dale, Chief, LSU did it just now again with, with Corey Raymond. A&M did it late in, in the uh, Sumlin era when they hired uh, Ron Cooper, who had been around all over the South and the Southeast. You see a lot of these type guys mm -hmm. come through and come and go. Um, A&M had it at, at the running backs position yeah. a couple, you know, a couple of years ago uh, with the guy from LSU. So there, there you see that a lot. Um, Tim Brewster's been that guy lately, you know, since he left A&M. He's bounced around a lot. Those are good coaches. There's something to be said for that experience, too. But mm -hmm. to get a, a kind of a fresh shot at it, I think that probably was probably was something that Elko was like, okay, this, this actually isn't a bad thing mm -hmm. uh, that Auburn is coming back. Um, Obviously, the way you would have kept him would have been to have raised him to keep him. I don't think A&M did that. And yeah. I thought that's probably pretty telling. Yeah, talking to Billy Lucci here on Tech Sags Radio. Billy, one more hire before we get into our guest. Kind of under the radar, uh, reports came out. A&M set to hire Kyle Hoke as a defensive analyst. Uh, any thoughts on that? No. In no. fact, <laughs> you saying that, uh, I don't know where that emanated from. It was a Nuno note, so okay. <laughs> I'm just um, going off of that. I've actually, I've actually, I, don't, I haven't talked to him in years, but I know Kyle Hoke mm -hmm. from way back in the day. Obviously, his dad's Brady Hoke, legendary. Mm -hmm. Le you know, I mean, Houston Texans for a while then was the head coach at Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, or was it John Hoke? So, but anyway, the Hoke family. And uh, I don't know, that's good, good. To keep, I think, in fact, I'm not sure if Hope years ago, if I was passing his name along to try to get a spot on one of these AM staffs when he was much younger. So mm -hmm. uh, he's been a football guy you know, since I've known him. And I, I could be wrong because you're hitting me live on air. See, this is what I tell Nuno. Yeah, not, that's my you've fault. Been no, you've been <laughs> thrown into the fire here today. Um, so I don't know which Hoke it is, but I, if I'm not mistaken, it could be a graduate of Clements High School, Sugar Lane. Mm -hmm. How about that? Cool. Right on, Billy. We're going to hit a break here. Soundboard disconnected, so we're going to stay quiet when we go off yeah. air. Uh, but when we come back, we'll dive into some Aggie hoops and uh, just talk about the overall roster maybe of, of Aggie football. You're listening to Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
Welcome back in. TechSags Radio presented by David Garner's Jewelers. We're here inside the Rollo Insurance Studio. TechSags co-owner Billy Lucci in studio with us for the final 30 minutes here on a Friday. Billy, big game coming up for Aggie men's hoops. They go on the road to Baton Rouge uh, for a little revenge game uh, if they can uh, take down the Bayou Bengals. So just what do you think they got to do to get back on track here in SEC play? A lot because... I watched that LSU Ole Miss game, and I think Ole Miss, you know, is isn't really tested. They they beat Memphis before Memphis caught fire, and then I guess Memphis finally lost. Was it last night or the mm-hmm. night before? South Florida, but um, other than that, they haven't really been tested. Uh, but they're a portal infused team by Chris Beard, and they're good, and they're athletic, and they were confident, and they went in there to the PMAC last night in Baton Rouge and got smacked around or two was that that was two nights ago yeah. yeah and they got smacked around pretty good so uh that's a tough I think it's a tough matchup for A&M with LSU's length I agree with what Logan said is you give Buzz Williams that quick a turnaround and a chance to kind of figure out what went wrong in their approach if if anything and, and obviously I, I'd hope you'd look at that and go something went wrong in our approach because mm-hmm. LSU smacked A&M around at home. I went from thinking certainly A&M was going to get revenge in that one, and I thought they were going to go up to Arkansas and beat a a bad Arkansas team. LSU is a better team than Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Right now, today, LSU is playing better basketball than A&M. So that's going to be a tough task for the Aggies to go in there and win. That went from one I thought they'd certainly win to you better avoid a sweep. At LSU, and if, if you're – it's tough, Nick, and it's a long conference season, so you can catch fire at the right time and go – you can beat a Tennessee and, and you play Ole Miss twice who's ranked, and you can go win some games and go beat Alabama at Alabama. There's plenty of opportunities to get hot at the right time, and you're going to see several teams do this over the course yeah. of an SEC season. Only the elite ones don't do that. Mm-hmm. Last year, A&M didn't do that. They were elite. They don't look elite this year. So they're probably one of the many that are going to do this. Luckily, you have a very strong conference resume. But they have to start hitting a, an upward yeah. upward trajectory uh, because you can't dig yourself too deep a hole. And, you know, if, if in the first five conference games you've lost twice to LSU and once to Arkansas, from the you know net the ranking so you're really hurting and you're you're cutting into a lot of what the goodwill you built up in the non-conference and yeah. each time you do it's like a massive drop so they really need to get it together in time for this weekend because then you've got a couple of i think you know very winnable games in what is it? it? It's Missouri. Put up the basketball is it Missouri, schedule, guys. Is it Missouri, then Ole Miss, then Florida? I believe so. No, I don't think it's three home games in a row. But it's, there we go. Um, okay, yeah. So you go, yeah, Missouri at home. Oh, yeah, it is three home games yep. in a row. So, I mean, if you can get LSU and then at Missouri, who's not, they're not good this year. So you've got an opportunity. That's why I thought that Arkansas game was such a big deal because – while I think LSU's playing better basketball than A&M right now and they're a bad matchup, mm-hmm. it's still winnable. Missouri at home, Ole Miss at home, Florida at home, at Missouri. I was looking at that as six very winnable games after Kentucky. And I'm not saying I thought they would go 6-0. and oh, Yeah. But I thought you could get 4-2 and two in that stretch. Mm-hmm. You could even maybe get a 5-1 and one spot if they were playing up. Now you lost to Arkansas. To get to four and two, you know, you got to win four out of five against LSU, Mizzou, Ole Miss, Florida, and Mizzou. Tall order. Do I think they can do it? Yeah, Mm -hmm. because of what's coming up. But if they win Saturday, Nick, I will expect them to hit a little bit of a heater at this stretch of the schedule. I'll actually expect them to do it. If they lose this one – you know, these three home games almost, they, they do. It's not almost. These three home games become must wins. Yeah. And they're not easy. Mizzou was a tournament team last year. Ole Miss is good this year. Florida is always tough. I, this Saturday is a big game, I think, in terms of it has a, you have a chance to swing things in a real positive direction. Mm-hmm. 
I'm not, you know, I'm not one to break down X's and O's when it comes to basketball, but just from watching them, it just seemed like every SEC game this year, the, the opponent has been able to play their style of basketball, right? Like Kentucky comes in here, and thankfully that day, a could hang yeah. and play their style. LSU, the first game, I was there, and it was just like, this doesn't look like the a and teams we're used to seeing. So just, I think A&M think drug Auburn into their style uh-huh. a little bit. Yeah. It wasn't enough. Mm-hmm. I think A&M went in there and mucked it up and took them out of. But that's about. I agree with you, and that's the kind of the one game that kind of stands out as an exception to me. Mm-hmm. Let's flip the script here to talking a little A&M football. Yeah. Uh, Nuno wrote down here he wanted to get into what you think – might be the strongest position position group as things stand now and maybe the biggest unknown in the roster. And guys back there, I threw together kind of a projected roster graphic. Uh, if you can put one up and we'll start wherever Billy wants to. I guess offense, there you go. Man, I can't see that far. Okay. Nick. I'm just going to have to go <laughs> No off. worries. Uh, and, I mean, and this isn't supposed to be a starting roster, yeah, just they, a guess. That's good work, but you got to be careful guessing because that's yeah, putting my name to it. and. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. So let's ignore that. Okay. Let's, it looks good. Let's leave it up. It looks pretty. Um, and I'm sure it's pretty accurate. But with that said, I want everyone to understand, you got a new coaching staff. Yeah. You got 100%. 23 players in the portal. There's going to be a lot. Whatever we think that roster is going to look like in the fall, yeah. no chance. Uh-huh. No chance. There's too much, too much new, too much competition. New systems, new coordinators, new position coaches, new strength coach to tell you, hey, this guy, this guy's not the answer. He don't mm-hmm. want it. You know, he doesn't know how to work. Or this guy really, you know, he's a lightning rod in here. He's great. He, he's an energy guy. He, you know, like, so, so much of that's going to change. They took it down. Yeah. I really didn't mean for them to take it down, but <laughs> they did. Um, Position, the, the strongest position on the team, I still think it's going to be defensive line. Mm-hmm. And that's a credit to um, Elko holding the roster together. That's a credit to the way the previous group recruited the defensive line. Mm-hmm. Uh, Terry Price, Elijah Robinson, it's a credit to how they recruited the D-line. Um, I think it's a, it was great work by the Texas A&M on the NIL side, the collective. Mm-hmm. Aggies United, just, you had these guys being tugged by ev- in every direction by every program in the SEC and around the country. Some of them fell victim to it. Mm-hmm. You know, Walter Nolan, Fidel Diggs, you lost McKinley Jackson to uh, the NFL. LT Overton was a young lineman. He's at Alabama now. Diggs is at Syracuse. Walter Nolan's very loudly at Ole Miss. Um, but it's always about who you bring back, mm-hmm. who you who's on the field for you, who's who's on your team. Well, let's talk about that. They went out and got one of the biggest coups in the portal the entire off season to get Nick Scorton, bring him back home from Purdue. Led to Big Ten in sacks. DJ Hicks looked tremendous in the bowl game. Five star freshman last year, he's back. Uh, Gabe Brownlow Dindy, a five star who got his feet wet in his kind of return year from an ACL, then looked good in the bowl game in spots. He's exciting. You bring back a veteran in the trenches that's played a lot in Albert Regis. He's starting to reach that kind of grown man phase of his career. Mm -hmm. And then keeping Shamar Stewart was a massive keep that people didn't talk about enough, in my opinion. Uh, He's probably NFL bound after this year and was playing great football at the end of the season. And then finally, you know, well, I want to see Malik Silla after – after a year in the weight room under Tommy Moffitt. Yeah. I want to see what he looks like in year three. He got to play a lot down the stretch this year. But the biggest one, of course, was the return of Shamar Turner, mm-hmm. who could have gone to the NFL, been a third, fourth-round pick. He came back. In the day and age of NIL, keeping guys like Shamar Turner, Anaya Smith, it's, it's a must. You've got to do that every year. You know, back if you'd had NIL a few years ago, A&M probably could have kept – Justin Matabike for one more year. Mm-hmm. He was not projected a first round pick or a second round. So you could have done that. That's what they did with Shamar Turner. So that D line to me is without question the strength. Mm-hmm. I like what they have at safety a lot, both mm-hmm. coming back, led by Bryce Anderson, 
uh, Jacoby Matthews and Jared Kerr, Dalton Brooks, but also what they added in the portal. Uh, Trey Jones is one that really stands out to me there, but they, mm-hmm. they've added some nice stuff there. Um, is it Dericky Wright at, at, from Vanderbilt, who I think is kind of a in-between guy. Same thing with Saunders. I think he's kind of a guy that could grow. Those two guys can play near the line of scrimmage. They're mm-hmm. kind of these very unique hybrid safety type guys. So I love the safety position. Those are the two that stand out most to me. Mm-hmm. And and I really like what they have at quarterback. Um, I'll be honest, I'd like a little more experience at QB. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, Jalen Henderson played in four games. I believe so, yeah. Is it four counting? Four, four plus counting, a play. Four yeah. plus a play or three plus a play. Well, Either way. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You, you get what I'm saying. Um, I think it's I think it's three, three plus, plus a play. play but, yep. So three games, you know, uh, Marcel Reed played in one game, mm-hmm. and the, both those guys showed well when they were really well when they got the chance. And then Connor Wigman's played in what four plus? He's played in about eight games. Mm-hmm. So I would I love what they've got at the position. I and, and then Miles O'Neill as a true freshman for first year depth. What I would really love is a little more experience. Mm-hmm. Connor's experienced mentally. He's going into year three. Jalen's an older guy. It's not the worst case scenario, but that's why I wouldn't put that position at number one. They, yeah. they as a collective, they they really haven't combined to play a season, roughly a season of college football. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's the one that ke- I love the position, but I'll keep it from putting it at the top. My biggest mm-hmm. concern, I'll be honest, I'm a lot less concerned about corner. Yeah, it's and crazy I wrote how that in the article, me. I'm expecting Tyreek Chappelle back. Mm-hmm. Um, I know his dad tweeted out something the other day, and everything I've heard, he's back. Um, I love what they've done through the portal at corner. And there's some young talent that, like, they got baptized this year, and it was rough. It, you know, think about in Oxford and in Baton Rouge and the bowl game. But you've got those guys with young talent, and they've maybe hopefully gone through the growing pains and get some uh, better coaching this this time through. And then you've got, everything they brought in Mm -hmm. i'm not worried about corner i was worried about it going into last year i was worried about it coming out of this year i'm not worried about it anymore i'm worried not worried if there's a position i'm like okay uh linebacker would probably be the one i think adding ej smith to that backfield makes me feel good about where that is with those four guys Mm -hmm. linebacker you know i want to see i'm 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 not scared of it with Torian York leading the way. You got I, I'm really big on Damian Sanford and Chance Johnson as young guys. Martrell Harris is still here. I like what they added uh via the portal with Scooby. Uh, you know, you get a guy that's played a lot at Florida. You get a guy out of Youngstown State that's six three, two thirty five and runs mm-hmm. a sub four six. And then I mentioned those two big, big safeties that can really yeah. help you in the box. So I think Mike Elko has plenty to work with in Jay Bateman. I just think it's it's probably your biggest unknown mm-hmm. in terms of your roster going into the season. 100%. We'll hit a break here. One final segment on the other side. You're listening to Tech Sags Radio presented by David Garner Schulers.
Welcome back in Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. And it's time to end the day with Double Dave's caller number 12 at 979-693-1150. We'll hook you up with your choice of dozen pizza rolls or a large one-topping pizza from Double Dave's serving Aggieland since 1984. Double Dave's Pizza serving up your favorite pizza and world-famous pepperoni rolls with reliable in-house delivery bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click DoubleDaves.com and your favorites are on the way. We're going to go to the uh, Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Jackson Moss, first day today, and he and, uh, yeah, he's got something to bring up to you, Billy. Yeah, I mi- apparently I missed this earlier. Jackson yeah, so, and I uh, I'm doing good. Yeah, I was telling uh, Nuno earlier that uh, back in, I think it was 2011, and we were just going into the SEC for SEC Media Days, and uh, it was after the Oklahoma wow. State game, and I actually met you and took a picture with you and my family. That's amazing. And I know, and now we've uh, come full circle. It's crazy. Oh, that's wild. My hair looks so bad. <laughs> like, I mean, it looks bad now. It looks worse then. I had no look. So thank you for that. Yeah, no, the I, SEC shirt, yeah. we were fired up. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. I believe that might be the same shirt I wore a year later when a and beat Alabama. You said that was the Oklahoma State game. Yeah, that was after. So the Oklahoma you were State. ready for you were SEC ready. Yeah, that's right. I think we lost that game at the end. We of the did. Year. Yeah, that was. Uh, there's that damn board where they put up the fake championships <laughs> that people have held against me on Twitter, as if I went and hung yeah. those damn things <laughs> up. Um, new AD, don't hang up fake championships. Don't get us made fun of with stupid crap. Um, yeah, that game, A and M was like it was like. I don't know exactly six and seven in the country or seven and eight, six and eight, A and M Oak State. Uh, Mike Gundy, they had Justin Blackman and I believe Whedon. Mm-hmm. And uh they had a good running back that year too, but it was Blackman and Whedon, maybe the running back from from Tyler Lee or John Tyler. And the Aggies were up like I wanna say twenty to three at halftime. Demontre Moore and Sean Porter back to back sacks. The half ended, it was like fourth and 42. Wow. Everyone, they're running in the locker room going nuts. The whole SEC contingent live, and everybody's here. Everyone in the national media is there. And uh, people are sitting there going, so what do we rank A&M? Like it's 23 at halftime. They're running a top 10 Oak State team out of the building. I think Tannehill scored on the first play of the game on a on – a, Zone read keeper, like 60 or 70 yards, probably 70 plus. And it was basically like, where do we rank? So does AM, are they number three behind Bama and I forget who else it yeah. was, USC, whatever, USC, Bama, AM three? And all the national guys are sitting there going, yeah, probably. Like you, you definitely jump them over, yada, yada, you know. They blow the 23 lead. And that's kind of the theme for that whole season. Mm. So, how old were you? I had to have been 10 or 11. Okay, 10 or 11. I wouldn't be surprised if at least one of those games at 10 years old drove you to tears. (laughs) Like, that's the age where you're just on the cut line of, like, crying after an Aggie (laughs) loss or not. Um, And there were a lot of them that year. Maybe it was the Texas game. Maybe it was... The blown lead at K-State. Maybe it was the blown lead against Arkansas, 35-17 at halftime when Bobby Petrino came back and cut you mm-hmm. up. It Man. stopped It stopped for the first year in 2012 when we had Johnny Manziel, and then that was fun to watch. And then, yeah, I know the tears kept on rolling about from, a, I guess he left in, what, 2013 until about now? We had a one. We, we had a two-year <laughs> tear break. I know. 2012 and 2020. And it's been a trail of tears ever since. Yeah, Got to drop it there, guys. Thanks for listening in to Texags Radio here on a Friday. Louis Bellina on the other side. This has been Texags Radio presented by David Garner's Jewelers.